So, hello, good afternoon, welcome, my name is Paul Grogan, and today I'm going to be doing a video on Through the Ages. I'm going to be covering the digital version today, but a lot of what you're going to see today actually does apply to the board game. There are a few differences with the digital game, which we'll talk about when we get to them, but when I had this idea for doing some Through the Ages videos, there was an overwhelming response from people who've either got the app and are struggling with playing well, or have got the board game, it's on their you know, pile of opportunity and they haven't got around to playing it yet. Um, the tutorial in the game is really good. It's a very, very good tutorial, uh, but it only takes you so far. And what I'm going to be doing today is I'm going to be going beyond the tutorial and teaching you some things about the game. So hopefully everything is working fine uh, and everybody can hear me. Yes, that's good. <laughs> um, now, I've been playing this game. This is, through the ages, a new story of civilization. I've been playing the original game, which was through the ages a story of civilization since it first came out in 2006 and then obviously the new version came out a few years ago and i've been playing that one since there's also an expansion for this game with new leaders and wonders i'm not going to be using the expansion today i'm just going to be using the base game um so yeah we're going to get started i'm going to be playing through a complete game today and i'm going to be explaining things as i go and i'm going to be talking to you about some of the strategies that i've picked up on now I am by no means an expert player, so if you are expecting to watch this video and see an absolute masterclass from one of the best players in the world with all really precise, detailed strategy, that's not it, okay? Um, I'll be honest with you, I can't win against very good players. So why am I doing this video? Well, I think the knowledge I've got of getting started is still valid, um, even though, as I say, it's not a complete master strategy. So there are people out there who know this game a lot more than me and they're probably going to add some comments into the video to say paul at 37 minutes you you said you were going to do this because the card's good it's been statistically proven that that card is the worst card in the game um yes i will happily accept any such comments like that as i say i'm not excellent at the game i think i'm good at the game but hopefully this will get you started right so off we go we're going to do a local game today um so yeah local game we're going to do a custom game we don't want to continue with the last one now, this is where I said at the start, you can actually configure it to use the tabletop rules or the digital rules. For this video, I'm going to be doing the digital rules. It does the bidding slightly different, um, basically to speed up play. Because if you're playing the physical board game, if something happens and then all players have to make a decision, then you can do that. But in the digital version, when you're playing asynchronously, that would slow the game down a lot. So we're going to be playing the digital rules today. It doesn't actually matter because I'm playing solo, but this is the way that I'm used to playing now. We're actually going to play with two other players. So we're going to play with Yellow, who is male, and uh, Yellow is going to be an easy AI. So there's four different AIs. There's training, uh, there's easy, there's medium, and there's hard. Now, as I say, I'm not that good at the game, and for this video, I'm actually going to set Yellow on easy. In fact, should I do two easies? I said I was going to do one easy and one medium. Let's do that. Okay, I might not win. <laughs> so we're going to do one easy and one medium. So there's the medium AI, uh, which is yellow, and the green one. Um, no, in fact, we'll play. We'll play. We'll play. We'll, we'll play green with the training one. So green is uh, going to be training, and yellow is going to be medium. And we're going to play a three-player game today. And the reason for that is that. There are certain cards in the game that you remove if you're playing two players, and I want to show those cards today, so I'm going to be playing a three-player game of it. Right, here we go. We're going to start. Uh, right, this is how every game starts. The game is actually divided into five ages. You start off in age A, the age of antiquity. This isn't going to last long. The main part of the game is ages one, two, and three, and then when the game enters age four, the game is pretty much over. So we're in age A at the moment, uh, it's randomly determined the turn order. You can see this on the right hand side. So I am first, then we have yellow, then we have green, and that's going to be the turn order for the entire game. The first round of the game, which is where we are now, is a very special round and it uses very cut down rules. Basically, if you look at this down here in the bottom right, it says I've got one white circle. That means I've got one civil action. And all I can do is take a card from the card row with that civil action. And then it will do my production and that's it. Very, very quick first turn. Yellow is then going to get two civil actions, green's going to get three civil actions, and then we start playing the game properly. So, I have a choice. If you look at this card row here, you'll see that these first five cards cost one civil action to take. That's the little white circle underneath. So I can only take one of those five cards. These next cards would cost two civil actions to take, and these cards would cost three civil actions to take. 
And these cards have been dealt out randomly. And although in Through the Ages, you always see every card, it's the order of which they come out which is going to drastically change the game. So, for example, I can only take one of these five. If I really wanted Moses, the chances are I'm not going to get it because somebody else is going to pick it up. So, I have a choice of taking one of these yellow cards, action cards, or Homer. This is the first decision that you need to make. Certainly, if you're going first and you've only got one action, you've got a choice of five cards. I will be honest with you, I am tempted to take Homer. Um, because it's a good leader to start with. It gives one happy face, and, and, and happy faces are really important. We'll come on to that later on, but that gives one happy face at the start of the game, which is really useful. The yellow cards tend to be thought of as bad takes for your first turn of the game, except, I believe, for Engineering Genius, which is amazing. It's a really, really good card. Um, if I could take those two, I would. So for me, it's a choice of Engineering Genius or Homer. Um, if I don't take Homer, now then, it might still, I think somebody else is going to take it, which means I might get the choice of Moses or Hammerarmé. You can only have one leader from each age, so it's not like another player is going to snap them all up. I need to make a decision here, and I am going to take... We're going to take Homer. I was going to take Engineering Genius, but I'm going to take Homer for this playthrough. So you drag it down. Homer is now in my hand. That is it. I am now out of Civil Actions. So you click End Turn. And this is the point where the computer does all of the admin. Um, if it's too loud, by the way, tell me in the chat. I can just about see the chat. Yeah, yeah. Tell me if the if the if the music is too loud in the background. And there we go. It's done all of the production, and it is now back with me. So a few things have happened here. But let's go through production first because this is one downside of the app. Is that it does everything for you, which is brilliant. But a few people have said, oh, we're following the app. And because it does everything for me, we don't quite understand what it's doing. Um, whereas if you play the physical board game, you're actually physically moving pieces around. Therefore, you probably would learn it better. So I'm going to go through it a little bit here. What happens at the end of um, your turn? So once you've used all of your actions and you click end a turn, you do production. And what happens is your farms, and you see here I've got two farms, and you can zoom in on them. Well, you can actually click that to show what the cards are. So you see here I've got the agriculture card with two yellow dots on it. That means I've got two workers on it, and visually that is represented by the lights on in the hook. So I've got two farms. Each farm will generate one food. So I now have two food. Then you have food consumption, but there's no food consumption yet. Then your mines produce, and again, every worker you have on a mine will produce one of these resources. Um, so we have two resources. You will have corruption before that, which we, we, we've not covered that yet. We also have one warrior here. We've got a scientist. This is Derek working as a scientist. Derek is producing one science, which you can see from here. I now have one science. I did have zero. I now have one. And the plus one means that at the end of this turn, I'm going to generate another one science. So you can see here, I am generating two food. I have two food and I'm generating two food. I have two resources and I'm generating two resources. I have one science, I'm generating one science. I have no culture and I'm generating no culture. The winner, by the way, is at the end of the game, the one with the most culture. So you want to get culture at some point, but right now it's not that important. So you'll see that that's happened at the end of any player's turn. If I click on yellow, we can see yellow has also got two food and two mines. And yellow took Hammurabi. Green... Um, got two food and two resources and took Moses and Urban Growth. So that was the cards that it chose to take. In the first round of the game, the card row doesn't change. It, nothing slides down, nothing changes, you just take cards from it. But following the first round, and from now onwards, at the start of every player's turn, so not at the start of the round, but at the start of every single turn, these two cards will disappear, because it's a three-player game, so these, these first two cards will go. If they, were, if they weren't there, they won't go. They will go if they were there. And then everything slides down, and then we get new cards from the deck. The AJ deck has now emptied. So we now have, you see here, this is the Age 1 deck. There are 51 cards in this Age 1 deck. You can actually click on it. There you go. You can see all of the cards that are in that deck. They're not in that order. Um, and then this is the military deck here. So what that's what's going to happen at the start of the round. So that happened. You saw that it shuffled the, the cards down and we've now got new cards. Okay, now it is my first proper turn and I have four civil actions and two military actions. This is what every player starts with 
and this is based on the type of government that you have. I am currently despotism, which means I get four civil actions and two military actions. We also have an urban building limit, which I'll come to later on as well. So there's various things that you can do with those actions. We've seen the action of taking a card from the card row, and you can take cards from the card row. If I really wanted to, I could say, well, I, I, I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to take that, and I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to take that, uh, and I'm going to take that. I could do, I could do that if I wanted to, and I've spent all of my actions on taking some cards. I don't want to do that, so I'm going to undo that. And yes, you can undo in this game, which is absolutely essential. The reason I don't want to take that is two reasons. There are better cards for me right now than those yellow cards. And one danger that new players fall into with this game is taking lots of cards. They go, oh, look, that's pretty. I'll take it. Oh, look, that's pretty. I'll take it. And you suddenly find you don't actually have the ability to play all of these cards. So try not to take too many cards. Only take cards that you're going to be able to play. Now, these purple cards are wonders. And these are the wonders from Age A. So we've got the Hanging Gardens, the Library of Alexandria and the Pyramids. Uh, the Hanging Gardens is my favourite wonder from AJ. I like starting with Hanging Gardens because it gives the two happy faces at the start. And happy faces at the start of the game are really important. And the only other way to get them is by building temples or with Homer. So normally, I would be taking Hanging Gardens because it's my favourite wonder. However, because I have Homer in play, I'm tempted to take another one because the library is also fantastic because it generates science and you need a lot of science early on in the game. Um, and the pyramids is also uh, a very good wonder. Now, I think I'm going to take the library of Alexandria. So yeah, I would normally take Hanging Gardens because it's my favourite wonder. I'm going to take the library of Alexandria. Now, this costs two civil actions to take. You can see here, it's got two little white dots beneath it. So we're going to take that card and look what's happened. It hasn't gone into my hand. Wonders do not go into your hand. Wonders go straight into play. You can see here, we are now starting to build the Library of Alexandria. And it actually costs three actions to build. The first action will cost one resource, the second one will cost four, and the third one will cost one. So we're going to need those resources at some point. And we could actually start building the first stage of the wonder here, but we don't want to. And the reason we don't want to is 99% of the time in this game, the f two of the actions you should do on your first actual proper round, which is now, is increase your population and build a mine. 99% of the time, that's what you should do. Now, I didn't do that to start with. I took the Hanging Gardens, but I still, too, I still do have two actions left. And that's what I'm going to do with my remaining two actions. I'm just going to have a look at Homer, because Homer is good for various stuff, but I'm not going to put Homer into play just yet, because it costs an action to put the leader into play. So I'm going to increase my population, which is this button here. That costs two food, which I have two food. So I click on that button and I get a population. We've now got two idle workers and I'm going to put one of them to work here, which costs two rocks. So the two, the two currencies in the game are, well, the two sorts of resources. You've got, you've got um, food and you've got rocks. Food is used for one purpose only, which is moving yellow beads from here using this increased population button into here. So it moves them from your bank into this area here. Once they are here, you can then bring them into play by building stuff. And if we look at, these are the cards. If you look here, building another agriculture farm costs two rocks. Building a bronze mine, two rocks. Philosophy, three rocks. Religion, three rocks. Everything that you build costs rocks. So it's food to get the workers and then rocks to put to, to basically build the buildings that the, 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 the workers are going to go and work in or building a wonder that cost rocks or building military units also cost rocks so that's it that's our four actions we increased our population we built a mine remember that's that's probably what you should do as the first two actions and then i chose to take library of alexandria now these two red dots here are military actions we're going to come on to those later on but if i really wanted to rather than building the, the other mine, I could have built another warrior. Warriors cost two rocks to use and that would have meant that I would have had an extra military strength, but it's so important to build up your production of resources early on. So there we go, end turn, and you'll see now what it does. When I click end turn, I'm gonna generate two food, I'm gonna generate two rocks, then these two cards are gonna disappear and everything's gonna slide down, and then we're gonna get cards from this deck to refill the gaps, and here we go. 
So production, rocks, food. I've drawn my military cards. That slid down and we are now in age one. So AJ is now over and we are now in age one and we can see what the other players are doing. So yellow is constructing the hanging gardens. I'm not going to cover too much what the other players are doing. I am going to try and keep an eye on it myself because you can't just play this game solitaire and ignore the other players. You really need to look at what the other players are doing, specifically for military strength that we're going to come to later on as well. At the start of my next turn, I am going to say thank you very much to CGE for asking me to create these videos. And CGE has kindly offered two codes for this game. So if you are watching this video, what you need to do is go onto this website. I'm going to put the link to it on screen now. There you go. So it's cge.as slash grcontest. Okay, if you go to that website now, that is a Google form. You don't have all of the answers yet, so don't fill the form in yet, but by the end of the video, you will have all of the answers um, to be able to fill in that form. And on Friday, so Friday the... What are we now? 20 seconds. Friday the 22nd of May at noon, British summertime, I will be doing a draw and two people are going to win a copy of this game, the digital version of this game. So thank you very much to CGE for offering that for the contest. As I say, there is the link, but there's no point going to it right now because you don't have all of the answers that you need. You've got one of them, but you don't have another one. Right, okay. So yeah, the form is active. I know what the questions are. I'm just telling you you don't have the answers. Right, we are now in... Uh, effectively the third round of the game. Remember the first round was a very quick round, second round we did stuff, third round we've got more options. So let's have a look at what we're doing. We've got our wonder, it's going to cost one resource as a first action, then four, then another one. Oh if only I'd taken engineering genius. Um, now the first thing is before we actually take our actions you will notice it says here, uh, where does it say? At the top, play a political action. So before you actually go into your main action phase you get to do a political action. And the there's various political actions available. Um, the one we're gonna do, and this is depending on the military cards that you've got. And if you look, I can see that the yellow player has two military cards in hand, but I don't know what they are, because military cards are kept secret. The green player has two cards in hand. The civil cards, on the other hand, they're open information, because you see the player, you, you saw that they picked them up. And a lot of people play the board game with the open information. Um, but the military cards, they're secret. So the two military cards I've drawn, I've actually drawn a tactics card here, and I've drawn a pact. So you'll notice in the top left of the pact, there is a crown. The crown means playing this card costs you your political action. And this is one tricky thing that people have with the game, is they think playing a military card is a political action, and that's not true. Because if you look at this tactics card, it doesn't have a crown in the top left. This card cannot be played as your political action. The Open Borders Agreement can. And I'm going to decide now whether I want to play this or not, because this is a pact. These are the cards you don't use in a two-player game. And in a three or four-player game, I could use my political action to propose this pact to another player. Now, I don't actually have any other choices other than skip my political action. So you might think, well, why not? Why not propose it? Because it's actually beneficial to both sides. Both civilizations will get one extra military action. These are the red dots. And the reason why I now have two military cards in hand is because I had two military actions unused at the end of my previous turn. So the more military actions you have unused, the more cards you get to draw. So having an extra military action is good. However, if you think about it thematically, open borders agreement. I have made a, an agreement with one of my neighbours that we have open borders and if either side attacks the other, they get a bonus. You've got to be very, very careful here. Don't just look at the good side of the pact, because if I propose this pact to another player and they accept it and then they attack me, it's going to backfire. I need to be deciding right now whether I am going to bother or how much I am going to go with my military strength bonus. And right now my focus is on building the library. So I actually, if I think, I've got three resources right now, one would go into there, and then I'd save two. Next round I'd get another three, giving me five. I could complete the Library of Alexandria next round. And you've got to think ahead in this game. You can't just think, what am I doing right now? You've actually got to be planning your next turn and possibly even the one afterwards. 
So I know that for the whole of this turn and the whole of next turn, all of my resources, all of my rocks are tied up with building the library. That means I'm not going to be able to increase my military strength. So I'm going to get a little bit behind. I think I'm going to, I'm going to propose it anyway. This is kind of, it's kind of a demo. I might not do this in a real game, but I'm going to propose it. And I'm going to take advantage of the fact that the, the green player was the inexperienced AI. It was, the green player is the tutorial AI. And the yellow player is the, is the more advanced. It's a medium AI. So I'm going to propose the pack to the green player. Okay. So let's see if green accepts. Green has accepted the pact. Okay, so there we go. If this was a multiplayer game, you'd have to send that off, and then the other player playing would then accept it or reject it. So you can see here that this pact is in play, and the green on the left of the seal means that... Um, oh no, I thought, I thought they'd fix this. I thought the one on the left showed the person who was proposing the deal. I'm sure I suggested that about three years ago. Anyway, it doesn't really matter who proposed it, but green and blue have got this pact. There you go. Right, that is my political phase over. So we are now in my main action phase. Remember, you only get to do one political action and we're now in my main phase. So we've already decided we're going to start building the library. So we're going to build one stage of the wonder, which costs one civil action and one rock. OK, we've got two rocks left, but we need to save them. We could increase our population again. I could put Homer into play. Let's have a look at the cards. We've got three civil actions left. Uh, okay. Ah, it's the ribbons. Thank you very much, Warren. So yes, it's these ribbons down at the bottom here that tells you, that tells you who proposed the pact. So you can see here it, the pact was proposed by me as the blue player, and the colours in the seals show who who actually is in the pact. Right. So let's have a look. We got three actions left, which means I could take one of these cards here. Now, here's the thing about taking cards from the card row. These five cost one action to take, these cost two, these cost three. That doesn't mean that these are any better. All of the cards in this deck were randomly shuffled and they are coming out and they start coming in at the right side and they will slide down to the left. So why would you spend three actions rather than just wait for it to come down and spend one? And this, this is a really tricky part of the game because there are certain cards and for example the two irrigations have come out i can click on the deck um yeah there's two irrigations they are out so i don't think there's any more irrigations in the deck uh all right there you go so we can click on that button there and it actually tells me where the cards are so we can see that there are two irrigations in a three-player game and both of them are right now they're on the card row so I've got to think, if I don't take this irrigation now, is another player going to take it? Is it going to slide down? Is it going to disappear off? Now, I don't have to take the irrigation, but if you see a card that comes out that is crucial to your strategy that you've chosen to go with, you need to decide if it's worthwhile you spending the extra civil actions to take it early, or you might not get it. So that's what you need to consider. Personally, I don't like spending more than I need to, but I have missed out on some of the cards before. Now, the other thing is I can't take a green card. I can't take a leader because these leaders are from age A and I already have a leader from age A. Even though I've only just taken it, I haven't put it into play yet. I have selected Homer as my leader for age A. Therefore, the game will not let me take another one. Um, we could, and we can't take this wonder either because you can only have one wonder under construction at any one time. So I can't take the pyramids. So we could choose country heritage. We could choose stockpile. Because I know all masonry is good. Masonry is a very well respected card. Now, let's have a think about this. Any card with a light bulb cost in the top left is called a technology card. And you'll see most of the cards that come out in the game are technology cards. And this is where I was saying don't take too many cards because this card I can take it, but to play it, I need three science. Let's have a look at our science. We have two and we're generating one. That's it. So if I took masonry now, I can't play it this turn, but I would be able to play it next turn, but then I'd have no science. So if I think, oh, swordsman's really good as well, and take that, suddenly I can't play swordsman for another four turns because I haven't got the science. But masonry is really good. Masonry is really good for a couple of reasons. Um, there's only one of them in the game. <laughs> so if I get it, nobody else does. But also it makes urban buildings cheaper. 
and it gives the it gives me the ability to build up to two stages of a wonder for one civil action. So that that is a contender. I am considering taking masonry. Do I want to put Homer into play? If I do, Homer's ability is that, as well as having one happy face, which we'll come into in a minute, I have one extra rock for building and upgrading military units. Yeah, it's a shame because my resources are spoken for. Hmm. So if I was to take masonry, let's let's just take it and see what see what we're going to do with the last action. I could increase my population again. I could, but then we get this orange unhappy face here. Which is fine, we're okay with that, but I'm not going to do that just yet. We could put Homer into play and just not use his ability. Because um, the sooner we do it, probably the better. I think that's what I might do. I mean, the other option is I take Stockpile or Cultural Heritage, but I, I'm not going to take them. No, I think that's what we're going to do. We're going to put Homer into play. So when you put a leader into play, where does it go? It goes over here. So you can see here, we now have the leader is into play and you can actually see the leaders of the other characters because they've all got special abilities which are really important and the reason the reason why there's now a red plus one here is if you look at homer's ability on your turn you have an extra one rock for building and upgrading military units so it's a free rock every turn that i can only use for one particular thing which is what the red plus one there is okay that is it that is my civil actions now i have military actions as well and we didn't use our military actions last turn because we couldn't um but i can now i could if i wanted to i could build a warrior that would cost a military action rather than a civil action and you can see that because it's a red circle rather than a white circle okay so i could if i wanted to build another warrior but remember what i said those resources they're spoken for so i don't want to do that but if i did that would give me a two military strength and oh actually i'm just thinking about this again now and this is this is what's great about this game is the thought processes that you go through let's just undo this let's just undo this a bit more okay here's what i'm thinking as another option because you you want to be ahead on military strength hmm as soon as these cards have gone this is the event deck. I'm kind of drifting off a little bit, but I'm just showing the thought process that you go through. This is the event deck. It is five cards because we're a three player game. It's two more cards than the number of players. This is the age A event deck. We can see that there are five cards in here. These are randomly selected from a set of 10 age A cards and they're all good, okay? None of these are gonna be bad for anybody. Every single card in there is a positive effect for everybody. So nothing bad is going to happen, but as soon as these cards have gone and the next set of events come up, that's where it potentially is going to get dangerous. So I, I was thinking, should I get ahead on military strength then? I'm not going to. I'm going to stick with my original plan. Which was, take masonry, build a stage of the wonder, not that one. Build a stage of the wonder. Uh, put Homer into play. Okay, so I'm not going to build a warrior, which is what I was thinking of. The other option I've got is, let's look at this card again. This is the heavy cavalry. This is a tactics card. And you know I said in the top left was a red dot and not a crown. So you do not play this card as a military action. You play this card as a, sorry, you don't play this card as a political action. You play this card as a military action. I have three spare military actions right now, so I could play it if I wanted to. And this is the other tricky thing about the game. If you look at the heavy cavalry card, it's got three horses on it. Some people think you can only play these cards once you have those three military units. No, that's not true. I can put this card into play right now. It has no effect on the game whatsoever until I do have three horses, but I could put it into play now. The reason why I'm not going to put it into play is two reasons. If I do, it's going to cost me a military action, which means I will then only draw two military uh, two military cards at the end of my turn, and I want to draw three. The other reason why I'm not going to do it is once you've put a tactic into play, other people later in the game can adopt that tactic, and this might end up backfiring. It might end up being better for other people. So I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to end my turn, which means it's going to draw me three military cards. Then I'm going to generate 
two food, I'm going to generate three rocks, the pyramids and cultural heritage are going to go and everything's going to slide down. Here we go. So we get the rocks, we get the food, I get me three military cards. Right, now let's quickly look what yellow is doing. Yellow is increasing population, building a lab. You can slow this down. Taking code of laws, interesting. And remember, yellow's a good player. Okay, I'm going to have a quick look at what the other players have done in a minute. Okay, neither of them have built up their military strength. Interestingly enough, there are six leaders included in AJ. Two of them have a military aspect. Well, maybe three. Um, Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar is in there. Neither of these two players have taken that, which means I can breathe a bit of a sigh of relief. So we're going to just have a quick look at Yellow. What Yellow has done is Yellow's built another lab. So remember I said Derek was a scientist and he was producing one science. Well, Yellow has got two scientists, Derek and Sheila. And each of them is producing one science, which is why it says here, Yellow is producing two science. So first big strategy tip of the game. You need science early. So the first part of the game, you really need science. You need to up your science as early as possible because otherwise you're going to get to the mid game and you're just not going to be able to play any cards. Okay, you saw that all of the cards are going to cost science to play. If your science output is still one at the end of age one, forget it. You're not going to get anywhere. So you need a way of increasing your science early on in the game. One of the ways of doing that is by building another lab. And the green player, what's the green player done? Uh, Green's built another lab as well. So yes, building your science up early on is important. I didn't build a lab because I've got the Library of Alexandria and that is going to start generating me a science. Uh, just a quick note, I'm not actively looking at the chat um, during this stream. Uh, I don't have the chat on screen like I normally do. So if you're sending me any messages, uh, apologies. I can't really see them. Um, the chat is there, but it's a bit too small for me. So yes. I can see that people are sending messages, thank you for that. Um, but yeah, I'm not actively keeping an eye on the chat. I've got enough stuff going on with <laughs> concentrating on this. Right, here we go. What's happening? It is my political phase again. So again, we have options, but this time we have two new options. Let's just have a look at these cards that I've got now. This, remember what I said about political actions. A card with a crown in the top left is a political action. Last time we played a pact. This time we have two cards. They are green cards. Green cards with a crown are called event cards. This is one of my favourite parts of the game. Remember, I've been playing this game since 2006 when it first came out. And the way that the events work in this game, I really enjoy. What you do is you play one of these event cards and you're actually seeding it into a deck called the future event deck. So it doesn't happen right now, but you are seeding that event and it will happen at some point later in the game. You need to remember what cards you've put in the event deck, and thankfully the app does that for you. This is what we're going to do right now. And I can either seed this one, Reign of Terror, sounds lovely, or a Vast Territory. Now, these cards look very different, okay? But they are both green, they are both event cards, and you play them both into the future event pile. Let's just have a look at Reign of Terror. The weakest civilization loses a population. Now, this doesn't happen when I play the card. This happens when the card, when the event card gets revealed from the event deck. So I, you need to remember, if I put this in there, I need to remember that when it comes out, I don't want to be the weakest. Do I want to play that card or do I want to put a vast territory into the deck? Now, the vast territory is, it's a territory and the, there's basically a, a bit of bidding that goes on and one player will win that bid and get the territory. If I'm not planning on going down the cartography route, because cartography is there, I can see cartography shouting at me from the top row, but that's going to cost me four science and I was planning to play masonry. So I think I'm going to put, I'm not going to put that. And this is another tip for new players. Be very careful about seeding territories into the deck because there are certain leaders and there are certain other cards which will give a big advantage when the territories come out. And I've seen it many times before that new players keep putting these cards into the event deck and then the player with James Cook and navigation and all of this lot, oh, another territory, I'll have that one, I'll have that one. And they're like, who put all these territories in there? And you're like, sorry, that was me. So yeah, be very careful about putting too many territories in the deck because if another player manages to get their territory engine going, uh, yeah, they're gonna be able to get them all. It's not as simple as that. There is more to it than that. But I'm going to put Reign of Terror in. So here's what happens. 
prepare this event and score one culture. The reason I'm scoring one culture is every time you prepare an event, you score culture, which is victory points, equal to the age that that card is from. This is an age one card. So by playing it, I get one point. That's what we're gonna do. Okay, I'll just explain what's happened there. Remember I said, this is the current event deck. This is the future event deck. Every time you play a card into the future event deck, you draw the top card of the current event deck. And when the current event deck is empty, you then shuffle the future events, move them across and they become the current events. So, there we go. Oh, it's happened. <laughs> uh, yeah, we can, we can actually check the log. You can see here what happened. So the development of science happened. That was the event card. Remember I said they're all good. And what happened is everybody got two science. So that affected all players. We all got two science. Is that going to affect what I'm doing on my turn? No, we need to build this library. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to play Masonry. This is a technology card. It costs three science to play. I have five science. So I'm going to put this into play. And it's gone over here. What is over here? Over here is for your special technology cards. Special technology cards are blue. And the reason why they're special is once you've played them, that is it. That is your technology. You have that card. You don't need to put any workers on it or anything else. I now have that ability for the rest of the game. So that is masonry. And that means now, if I look at this, instead of it costing me two civil actions and five rocks to complete the wonder by building two stages, which would have been a four and then a one, because of masonry, I can build two pieces of a wonder or two stages of a wonder with one action. And that's what we're gonna do. That wonder is now complete and we can see what it's doing for us. It's gonna generate as one culture every turn, not just a one-off every turn and also one science every turn. And we can see that here. So I'm now generating two science a turn, one for my labs, one for my library, and I'm now generating one culture per turn from the library. So that had an immediate effect. And again, that wonder sits there, generating these bonuses for the rest of the game. I don't need to put any workers on it. That's why wonders are wonderful. Right, we've got two civil actions left. What do we wanna do? We have plenty of food. We, we have the one bonus resource from Homer, but that's not enough because it costs two to build a warrior. You can see here, two. And again, it's red, which means it costs a military action to build. So, I, long term, I'm gonna go for this. This is the tactic I'm gonna go for. I need three, I don't need three infantrymen to play the card, but I need three infantrymen to make it active. So this is what I'm gonna plan to do. The next thing is I'm going to be building up my warriors and I'm going to be playing that. No, I can't do that this turn because I don't have any more resources. I could take another population. But I think I'm going to look at taking cards. Now we generate... Ah, science. I've got two science and I'm generating two. So next turn I'm going to have four. So these irrigations that I was talking about, I might take one of those. Or do I take iron? If I take iron, I can't play it next turn. Because if you look, it costs five science. So I'm tempted to take one of these irrigations. It doesn't really matter which one, because neither of them is going to go. So that goes into my hand. I'll explain that next turn. I've got one civil action left. Oh, I've got rich land. Oh, there you go. Right, now, yellow cards are action cards. I don't think we've played any action cards yet. Action cards are one-off. You play them, you do what it says, and then they're discarded. The special rule about the yellow cards is that you cannot play them on the turn that you pick them up. So you know what I mentioned earlier on about having to plan ahead? And this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna take rich land into my hand because next turn it's gonna allow me to upgrade a farm. And that's exactly what we're gonna be doing next turn. So there we go. That is all my civil actions done. Military actions, what do we do? Do we put the Legion into play now? Because I know at some point I'm going to use it. Or do we just leave it and draw three cards for the three military actions? I think I'm going to leave it. You do have a military hand size limit. And as soon as I click end turn, it would make me discard down to that. But my limit is three because I've got three military actions. And I have three cards in hand. So I'm actually just going to end my turn now. And the magic happens. There you go. Right, let's see what Yellow's doing. Yellow has taken Christopher Columbus, and Yellow has played Christopher Columbus. 
developing code of laws, building a temple, oh. taking reserves. Right, that's what yellow's done. We're going to take a little look in more detail at yellow before I take my next turn. Let's see what green's going to do. Ah, so green has developed cartography. So I'm glad I didn't put that island in. Yeah, green's got corruption already. Green is really not a good player. The AI, he's actually, I, I remember speaking to Matush about this, who is the main guy at CG Digital for doing the AI. And he had to actually add extra coding into the game to make the, a, make the weak AI play bad. Um, it's very cool. Really, really cool discussion that I had with him about AI and how it works. Anyway, I said I was going to have a look at yellow. So what yellow's done is yellow has built a temple. Uh, temples generate culture and provide happy faces. We still haven't explained happy faces, but yellow also developed code of law. So whereas we developed masonry, um, which gave us discount on buildings and building wonders, che um, not cheaper, but you know, more efficiently. Code of laws is a very, very simple card that gives one extra civil action, which might not seem much, but that's one extra action every turn for the whole game. So that's what yellow's done. Yellow is thinking about building the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, but hasn't actually started yet. Um, green, on the other hand, yeah, green's, green's taken cartography. So cartography is going to help when any territories come out of the event deck. It also gives one military strength. We haven't covered the military strength aspect of the game much yet. I'll come on to that later. So it's back to me, and it is my political action. And look at all these cards. Oh, right. Okay. Thank you very much. So you know what I said about not putting territories into the deck? I've drawn three territories. Wow. <laughs> now, so I need to decide. There are advantages to me putting a, uh, an event into the deck because I get one point. Every time I seed an age one card into the event deck, I get one point. And it is going to trigger the next age event. Whatever that is, it's beneficial, but it's beneficial to all of us. But by putting a territory into the deck, the green player has more of an advantage of colonizing that territory. So I need to decide whether I'm actually going to do it or not. I wonder what expert players would do. Would they put a territory into the deck at this point, knowing that green has got cartography? Well, I'm going to do it. Whether it's the right thing or not to do, I'm going to do it. All the territories are different. This one gives you food and some yellow uh, yellow things for the bank. This one gives science. And this one gives rocks. I'm not sure. I'm going to put the developed territory into the event deck. Okay, so I've scored a point and the development of markets is the event card that's come out. So all civilizations on your turn gain two food and two rocks. And at this point, I'm just going to mention a slight difference between the, the digital adaptation and the board game. In the board game, that would happen right now, okay? The event card would come out and all players right now would need to decide if they wanted two food or two rocks. The way the digital version is it actually places a little reminder at the start of each player's turn and then at the start of that player's turn, then they make the decision. It means that when you're playing this asynchronously, you can do your turn, finish your turn, send it off when it's the next player's turn, they get a pop-up saying, development of markets, do you want two rocks or two food? So it speeds up the, um, the asynchronous games. 99% of the time, you're probably going to take rocks at this stage in the game. And I definitely am because I've got lots of food. So I'm going to take two rocks. Now, we're going to have a productive turn this turn because look at this. We have six food. We have five rocks. Remember, we've got the extra one rock from Homer. So yeah, here's what we're going to do. Uh, we are going to use our first military action to build a warrior. You can see, again, the number is in a red circle. That means it's going to cost me a military action and two of my lovely rocks. Well, no, it only costs one because Homer gives me a bonus one. So that only costs me one rock. I now have two warriors. What does a warrior do? A warrior gives me one strength. I have two warriors, which means I have two strength. You can see there, two strength from two military units. It's telling me exactly where that's coming from. We have no idle workers left, so I can't, I can't build any more stuff, but I'm now going to increase my population, which is a civil action. Now, if you just look at that, it costs two food, but now it's going to cost three. Why is it costing three now when it cost two a minute ago? Let's have a look at the yellow bank. This is the yellow bank, and at the start of the game, this is filled with yellow workers, and 
that yellow dot, let's just go back, let's just undo that. Let's look at the yellow bank now. There you go, that yellow dot is there. It's in this column, which means it costs two food to take. But as soon as that's gone, okay, that column is now empty, which means it now costs three food to take the, to take the next one. So as your empire gets bigger, the cost of taking extra workers increases. Three, four, five, and then seven. Also, this number here, this minus one, which you can now see here, and you can now see here, is consumption. Consumption is not something you can avoid. Don't try to avoid it, because it's just inevitable. The more yellow workers you take out of your bank, the more food consumption you're gonna have. So don't worry about food consumption. It is just part of the game. What happens now, though, is I'm gonna generate two food, and one of them is gonna be consumed. So my food production has actually now slowed down. Right, we have three civil actions left and we're now going to build this mine. Well, yeah, I'm going to go through the motions. Here's what I was planning to do. I was planning on playing irrigation, which I can do because it's cost me three science and this is called developing this technology. So it's one action. Everything you do in the game costs an action. So one action, three science, we're going to develop this technology. Now, where's it put it? Because I've got an itchy nose. Because it's a farm, and if we actually click on this, you can see the physical cards, it's actually played it in the same column as the previous one. If you look at the icon in the top right, this is the little wheat symbol. This indicates that it's a farm. So what this means is that irrigation is actually a better version of agriculture. It's a farm, just like this, but it's a better version. However, these two workers here, they're still doing agriculture. This is an, another fundamental concept of the game to get. This is a card, okay? This is a technology card. I have played that card. I don't have any farms yet. I don't have any irrigated farms. I still only have agriculture farms. But by playing the card, you now have the technology to be able to build them. But building them is another action. And I can either build one by spending four rocks, or you can upgrade by moving a yellow dot from here to here, and it costs the difference. And let's have a look at this card that I took. Rich land allows me to upgrade <clears throat> a mine or a farm and pay two rocks less. So upgrading would normally cost me two rocks because it's the difference between the two and the four. But because I've got rich land, I can play rich land and I can use it to, uh, here we go, play to upgrade an age A farm to age one. Okay, so now if we look, we have one worker still using agriculture who's not very happy because his neighbour has suddenly been upgraded to use nice irrigated farms. What is the benefit of having one dot on here? It's this number here. This is a two instead of a one. So actually, I'm now generating three food a turn instead of two. This one's generating two food. This one's generating one food. Okay, so that was another action. We only have one action left. And at this point, although that was my plan, I'm actually going to take a look at the card row because suddenly... I might look at something and go, ooh, I'll do that instead. Now, because I finished this wonder, I can now take another wonder. However, taking a second wonder from the card row will cost one extra civil action. It basically costs a number of extra civil actions equal to the number of wonders that you've already completed. So if you look here, you can see Great Wall, two dots, Taj Mahal, two dots. It would normally be one, but because I've got one wonder already completed, it's going to cost me two. So I can't take either of those. I could take Bread and Circuses, I could take Printing Press, I could take Engineering Genius. What we want to do first though is we want to build another warrior. Because remember, we have a tactics card in play. Did I play it? No, I didn't. I didn't play it. Let's do that first. We're going to use this to build another warrior. Okay, so we now have three warriors in play, giving me a military strength of three. But now I'm going to play this card. This cost me one military action to play. We're going to adopt this tactic. There we go. We now have five military strength. Three because we have three warriors and two because we have three infantrymen. If I had six warriors, I would actually get this bonus twice. Okay. So what a tactics card means is as long as you have the indicated number of military units together, they fight together as a group and you basically get enhanced military strength because of it. So military strength is a massive aspect of this game. I now have five 
over the one that yellow has and the two that green has. It's not that common to get such a, a high strength lead early on, but that's the advantage of Homer being able to build them cheaper. And there's a little bit of a luck factor. I managed to draw the Legion military car, uh, the Legion tactics, which worked well with what I was doing. In fact, if I hadn't have drawn it, I probably wouldn't have done that. So you've got to play to sometimes the cards that you get. Now I've got one action left. And there is another concept I'm going to explain at this point. Some of you might be asking what this is here. And I've actually had a number of questions uh, through the Gaming Rules Slack channel and various other messages about what this number is. And you if you remember back to what I said right at the start, is the digital implementation of this game is fantastic because it does all of the admin for you. The downside is when it is doing the admin for you, sometimes you don't quite understand it. So I'm going to, I'm going to talk a little bit now about corruption. Because if, this is the blue bank, this is the blue bank here, and because this section of the blue bank is empty, there's nothing in it at all, we are about to face two points of corruption. Now, corruption is something you want to try and avoid at the start of the game. It isn't the end of the world, it isn't game over, but early on in the game, resources are really, really important and they're scarce, so you want to try and avoid corruption if you can. There's two ways to avoid corruption. Well, in, fi in this case, there's one way. Basically, I mentioned the reason why we are suffering minus two corruption is because this is empty. There are no blue counters in this section here. So how do we get a blue counter in that section? We build something. As long as we move a blue thing back to the bank, we're fine. We're not corrupted. Thematically, this represents that if your government is stockpiling its resources and not doing anything with them, somebody's going to walk off with it. That's what it represents. And that's done in the game really nicely by means of this corruption mechanism. And we can absolutely easily spend one resource. That's all we need to do. And we, we've actually got a couple of ways of doing it. I could increase my population. It's going to cost me three food. I have three food. See, corruption is gone. I could do that. That's one option. The other option, I could actually upgrade this because we've got two rocks left. So I could, if I wanted to, upgrade this to there, which costs two rocks, and that's the corruption gone as well. I'm going to have a think about which one of those I want to do. Um, and it's all based on... Or th I mean, the other option is if I really wanted printing press right now, I could just take printing press, end turn, and lose the corruption. The corruption, the minus two, basically means before production, I am going to lose two rocks. So I'm not going to do that. I'm just saying it is an option. If, if, if you really wanted to do that, if there was a card you really wanted to take, just soak up the corruption. Um, but I'm, there's no way I'm going to do that. So I think I'm going to increase my population. There we go. Okay, so that is it. I've spent all of my civil actions. I have also spent all of my military actions. And if you remember what I said earlier on, you draw cards at the end of your turn for each unused military actions. So I'm not going to draw any more cards. These cards here, that's what I've got. I'm stuck with those. But I am going to generate two food. I'm going to generate three rocks. I'm going to generate two science. And I'm going to generate one point of culture. I'm happy with that. The other thing that I'm going to talk about at this time is this is not a scripted video. I'm doing this live and I'm playing the game and what you're seeing here is exactly what's happening. Every game of Through the Ages that you play will play out differently. I have played Through the Ages roughly 250 times, okay? And every game plays out differently. I would love this video to cover every aspect of the game, okay? But we might not see that, okay? There are certain aspects of the game we just might not see because every game plays out differently. If we don't see certain things in the game, I will mention them at the end of this video. And hopefully this is actually the first video in a series of videos. And over the course of the videos, you're going to see different aspects of the game. Anyway, we have another Age 8 event that's been revealed where we all gain a population for free. When do I talk about Happy Faces? I'll talk about Happy Faces in a minute. Happy Faces is the most complex um, mechanism to get to understand in this game. So yeah, I'll explain that later on. 
how are we doing? I hope you're enjoying it. As I say, I can't really see the chat. I can see messages are being sent in the chat. So yeah, thank you very much to everybody for joining in with the chat. Um, apologies about the missing sound at the start. <laughs> that happens now and again. Right, so it is back to my turn. Let's just have a look what Yellow did. Uh, so Yellow's got two temples. It's still got this hanging gardens. Now, you do have a limited amount of time to build wonders. You have that age and the one afterwards. We are currently in age one and we have 17 cards left in the age one deck. As soon as they've gone, we move into age two. And if this hanging gardens is not built, it's going to collapse. Uh, green, let's have a look at what green's doing. Green's not, oh, green's got, ah, now look at this. So green has got an upgraded swordsman. So like we upgraded the farm, from agriculture to irrigation green has actually got an upgraded infantry card so this is a swordsman every yellow dot on here is worth two strength so green has actually look at that green has got six strength wow the other thing i want to mention at this point is this little arrow here this is the overview and this is absolutely essential when you start playing the game because right here you can see everything you need to see you can see what wonders everybody's got how many happy faces how many spare workers, how many actions, how many cards in hand, how many resources everybody's producing. And we can look at this and we can see, oh, okay. So we're all producing the same amount of science. We're all producing the same amount of resources. I'm currently winning on getting more food. Um, Yellow's producing slightly more culture than us. Don't worry about these numbers, right? I've got four culture. A winning score is anywhere from 150 to 300. So don't worry about the fact that, oh, Yellow's producing two culture return instead of my one. These are minutely small scores for the moment. Right, okay, let's close that down. Yeah, that's an overview, really useful. Keep looking in there. Okay, so um, it's us, it's our turn. Here we go, we are in our political action. What do we want to do? Because we didn't draw any cards, we still only have these two cards left and I don't know whether I wanna put them in. Oh, you see this exclamation mark? That is reminding us that we have uh, an outstanding event that I'm going to resolve at the start of my turn, which is going to basically gain me one population. Oh dear, do I put another territory into the deck? Hmm. What I'm going to look at is I'm just going to click on here because, you know I said that you need to remember what cards you've put into the event deck? Well, you do in the board game. In the digital game, it actually tells you. So I can see here there are three cards that have been added to the event deck. The green player has put one of them in. And I have put these two in, and it actually shows me the ones that I've put in. Um, I want Reign of Terror to come out early. Because right, right now I am not the weakest civilization. And the way that I get it out early is by putting more events in to get rid of these so that these then come in. So we are going to play it. We're going to play a vast territory. It's possibly the wrong move, but let's do it. So I get a point for that, and we get Development of Warfare. On your turn, you may build a warrior's unit for free if you have an idle worker. Okay, I'm going to mention these AJ cards now because I am going to increase my population for free. I'm going to build the warriors for free and I might undo that in a minute. You can even undo that decision. So I, I mentioned at the start that there are 10 AJ event cards in the game and five of them, because it's a three player game, the number of players plus two, five of them were taken out at random, shuffled, and they were made into the AJ event deck. Okay. Two of those ten cards give you a bonus if you have a spare worker. One of them allows you to build a temple, one of them allows you to build a warrior. In this particular game, both of those cards have come out, but they might not have come out. So one of the tips for new players is, until all of the AJ event cards have gone, Keep a spare worker here, because then if one of those events does come out, you can actually take advantage of it. You don't have to do it. There are some times where I haven't done it, but that's the recommendation. What you don't want is you don't want the, oh, everybody can build a free temple. And you're like, oh, I haven't got a spare worker. Why didn't I know about that? So my advice is until all of the age A event cards have gone, keep a spare worker here. Okay, well, or until those, if those two events have gone, that's fine, because there's only, there's only two events in the 10 that allow you to do something with that worker. Anyway, let's just undo those things that we did so we can do them again. So we're increasing our population for free. That was an outstanding event. 
building warriors for free. Why wouldn't we do that? Because it's free. So surely we should. Well, click on this little button here, minimize it, because we could build a warrior for free, but it's still gonna use up one of these workers. And if we had other plans for those workers, and that's why sometimes you don't want to do it, even though it's free. In this case though, I am going to do it because colonization is about to, or so the, the territories are about, are about to come up for colonization. Uh, that's gonna be happening soon. So I want some extra military units. So I'm planning ahead for two, three, four turns time. Right, it's our go. We got four civil actions. We got three military actions. Let's look at the situation. We're doing all right for food. We're producing enough food that we can get a nice supply of extra workers. We have five rocks and we're producing three a turn, so that's not bad. Uh, Derek is producing one science and we're getting an extra one science from the library. That's not bad, but we probably want more science. We don't have any temples yet, but that's okay because we have Homer and Homer is giving us one happy face. Now, fairly soon, one happy face is not gonna be enough. We're gonna need two or three. And let's talk about replacing leaders. No, let's not. I, I would have done, but if we look at the row, we only have Michelangelo here. Now, Michelangelo is awesome, but he's not awesome enough with the cards that I've got to take for three actions. There is this university. Oh, I love this card. Because remember what I said, science is really important early on, and this university will produce two science a turn for no workers do I take it? Right, it's going to cost me three actions to take it. Remember, it's normally two, but it's plus one because I have one completed wonder. That's one option. I could take the university. If I took the university, it's going to cost a total of nine resources to build. I currently have five and I'm getting another three. So that means that I won't be able to build it this turn. I won't be able to build it next turn. I will be able to finish it the turn afterwards unless I have a way of getting extra resources, which I don't think I do. Right, what are my other options? My other option is printing press. I really like printing press. Should we take printing press? I think we will. Yeah, let's take printing press. This is a library. Yeah, I'm gonna take printing press. Um, again, you have so many choices in this game and you won't make, there isn't always a right answer. If there was always a right answer, then you know, there wouldn't be much choice in the game, but there's so many little micro decisions to make. I think I'm going to take printing press because I like the card. We're going to take it into my hand. Now we could actually play it this turn. Remember, it's only the yellow cards that you cannot play on the turn that you pick them up. Every other type of card, you can play it. So I'm actually going to put this into play. It costs three science, which is what we've got. It does then leave us with no science. And it's gone over there. So let's just have a look at these cards. Remember what I said about the irrigation? The icon in the top right matched that of agriculture. This meant it was also a farm and therefore the card was vertically above it. The printing press, however, has a book icon. This means it's a library. This is a lab. This is a lab. This is a temple. This is a library. So it's a different kind of card. So it has its own column to go in. It's the reason why it's on a different level is it, it's an age one card. So it's an age one card. It's a library. It's a different type of building and every worker on here will generate one culture and one science. So it's kind of like a better version of a lab because it produces um, culture as well as science. Also notice this is in a green circle and it costs two. A printing press normally costs three to build. Why does this only cost two? Masonry. Remember this technology I took earlier on if we look at masonry? Urban buildings have a reduced cost. Urban buildings are the grey ones. Okay, so farms and mines are brown, urban buildings are the grey ones. And every urban building, an age zero, sorry, an age A urban building doesn't cost, I don't get a discount, but every other urban building from ages one, two or three, I get a discount of one. So this is a nice little combo here. It's not really a combo. We're now going to put one. So we're going to drag that to here. There you go. So our science output is now three. And our culture output is two. Not that I'm worried about culture for now, but science is really important at the start of the game. Yes. Now then, 
what have we got? We have one action left. We're not corrupted, so always keep an eye on the corruption. Because if we were corrupted at this point, we'd be wanting to do something to spend those resources. Um, I don't have any spare workers. I could get an extra worker. Or we could take a card from the card row. Is there any of these that I want? I don't think there is. No, I'm not interested in taking any of those. So I'm going to click this. We're going to get an extra population. We still have three military actions to use. I could... We've still got Homer as well. Should we build another warrior? Let's go absolutely crazy on warriors. Yeah, okay, we're going to build another warrior. Normally cost two, get a discount of one because of Homer. There you go. Wow, I got five warriors <laughs> at this stage in the game. That's not, that's not normal. Um, but it's because I've had some extra yellow workers because I got my food production up early. Okay, interesting. Right, we've got two actions left. Now, you'll notice I've got two other tactics cards in hand. I don't want to play these for two reasons. First of all, um, you can only ever have one tactics in play. So if I was to play one of these right now, it would actually replace my existing one. Uh, and my existing one is actually getting me two extra strength. Remember, if I have three infantry, I get plus two strength. So if I was to play this right now, I could, but I would actually lose... You know, this, this is a better tactics card in that it gives three strength, but you need two infantrymen and a cavalryman. And I don't have any horses. So, yeah, I'm not going to play that. I think that's it. I'm going to end my turn there. How are we getting on? Drawn some more event cards. We've filled the card row. Ah, Yellow has started building the Hanging Gardens, finally. And it's built another one. Is it going to finish it? No, it's not going to finish it. It's out of rocks. It will finish it next turn, though. I was really hoping to have drawn a brown card so that I can show you the aggressions in this game. I mean, I'm, I'm hoping we, we do see the... Oh, we've seen an aggression. <laughs> Thank you for that. So here's an aggression. This is probably going to disappear off screen. So green has played an aggression card on yellow and has attacked them. And this is how the attacks work in this game. You can't just choose to attack somebody. You can only do so by means of the cards and the aggression cards are the brown cards they are drawn from the military deck so there is again you've got to you know you've got to play the hand that you get i didn't draw any of these brown cards if i had have done i would have been using them but green did and what oh it's not disappearing that's good um so green has done a, a successful aggression against yellow when you do an aggression card against somebody you compare the military strength and this is what the military strength is for Green has a military strength of six. Yellow has a military strength of two. That was a difference of four. There are ways that you can defend yourself, but yellow, in this case, wasn't able to, which means the result of this aggression happens. Now, just before we go any further, have a look at the top left of this card, the crown. Remember what I said about the crown. That means playing an aggression card counts as your political action. You only get to do one political action per turn. Also, there's a red dot on it. So as well as it costing your political action, it also costs you a military action, okay? This is another thing that trips people up. They see the red dot and they think, oh, I can play this on my turn as a military action. No, you play it in your, you know, in your politics phase as your political action. You can't play it in your normal main part of the turn. If it's successful, it does what it says on here. In this, in this case, it's destroy one of your rivals age A or age one urban buildings and you gain rocks equal to half its cost rounded up. So what's happened is green has done a raid on yellow and has destroyed, you can see here, it's destroyed a lab. Now, there's a difference in this game between destroying a building and losing the population, okay? If you think about it, that lab actually had a yellow worker on it working away, Derek. When you destroy the building, the building's gone and the yellow worker is still there. The yellow worker runs away and goes back to your idle pool. That is different from losing population. If you lose the population, the yellow worker actually goes completely back to your yellow bank. But in this case, green has just destroyed the building. Which is good for us. That's what we like, squabbling between the two other players. Okay, what else is green doing? Green's also building another temple. Uh, right, Green has started building the University of Carolina. See, green keeps getting corrupted. Remember, Green is not a very good player. Green is making lots of, you know, mistakes that a new player would make. Right, it's my turn. 
I'm now going to talk about the end of the age because it's imminent. We are almost at the end of age one. We can see that because there's seven cards left in the deck. And this is really important once you really start getting to grips with the game, knowing what those seven cards are. So we can see here, uh, Iron is on the card row. The other Iron is still in the deck. I think that's in the deck. Oh no, that's the discard pile. Um, Irrigation is in the blue card player's hand. Uh, Swordsman is in the green player's hand. Is that a hand? No, that's in play. Yeah, that's actually in play. Um, so yeah, you can see, we know what those seven cards are in the deck. We know that there is Frederick Barbarossa, Theocracy, Frugality, Breakthrough, Urban Growth, Alchemy. They are the seven cards. Slightly touching on advanced strategy here, but what I'm saying is that you know what other cards are in the deck. Anyway, seven cards more. <clears throat> At least two are going to go at the start of every player's turn, so it could be that Age 1 is about to end. When Age 1 ends, a few things happen. The thing that I'm worried about is Homer is going to die, because Homer is an Age A leader, and an, a leader will survive for their age and the one afterwards. And I don't want Homer to die, because Homer has an ability that when I replace him, so not when he dies, but when I actually replace him, which we've not seen that yet, I can slide Homer in under one of my completed wonders uh, and Homer will generate a happy face for the rest of the game, which is Homer's legacy. That's what that represents. So I want to replace Homer this turn. And how do I replace Homer? If you get a new leader and then play the new leader and that replaces the old one. Okay, but before that we have our political phase. Now. I've, I've drawn another territory, haven't I? <laughs> Here's Malta. Um, I don't want to play any more territories, but we do have this. Now, this is a controversial card because um, it basically gives four culture to the strongest civilization. And a lot of people in this game think that the player who is the strongest in terms of military strength is the one that's winning. That's not always the case. I have played this game before where I have really gone for it with military strength and I've had the highest military strength the whole game and I've been attacking people everywhere and I didn't win. So, yeah, you've got to balance everything in this game. But basically, if I play this, I want to make sure when it comes out that I'm the strongest and I'm not the weakest. Okay, so I'm going to play this. And we're going to have the final Age 8 event. Right, development of civil life. So all civilizations on their turn can basically do one of those things. There's lots of different options there and you can do one of them. But what happens now? Look at this. Okay, so remember, when, I, when, the, when the current event deck is empty, we take all of the future events, shuffle them together, and that is now the new current event deck. So there are five cards in the current event deck. We'll have a look at them in a minute. It will remind us which are the ones that we put in, but we don't know which order they're coming out in. Okay, which, what do we want to do from this development of civilization? Oh, sorry, development of civil life. Well, in fact, most of our options are, <laughs> yeah, because we don't have any spare workers. So I'm going to use the top one, which is raise your population for one food less than it would normally cost. Okay, so let's have a look at this event deck. Here we go. Oh, no, I put four cards in. <laughs> so out of the five events, which are coming out next, four of them I put in. And I can see what they are, and I know that I want to be the strongest civilization when that comes out, and I don't want to be the weakest when that comes out. We're fine. I've currently got seven. So remember what I was saying? I want to try and replace Homer this turn, because if I do, I will get the benefit of Homer's legacy, and I will get this happy face. If I don't, Homer's going to die, and then I, I lose the effect. I don't, I don't get it. I think that's right. Yeah, when you replace Homer. So you've got to actually replace it. So how do you replace it? I take a new leader, and then I play that leader. And we have a choice. We can take Joan of Arc, Genghis Khan, or Leonardo da Vinci. Now, I'm leaning towards Leonardo da Vinci because Leonardo da Vinci is a good card. He basically boosts my labs and libraries. He's going to make my library produce an extra science. So he's really good in that respect. He's going to work well with, with the cards that I've got. However, now Joan of Arc is no good to me because she's going to boost my temples. 
She boosts temples and other things. Right, so no, I'm not going to go with Joan of Arc, even though she's really cool. Genghis Khan is the other option. And I'm looking at Genghis Khan for a couple of reasons. The first reason is somebody sent me a message on Facebook today to say that Genghis Khan was their favourite leader, even though they've never played the game. I think it was Stuart. So I'm taking. I might. I'm going to consider taking Genghis because it's Stuart's favourite leader. The real reason I'm considering taking Genghis is because of Genghis's ability. What Genghis Khan does is, my infantry units, of which I have five of them. These are all infantry units. If I have Genghis Khan, then for the purposes of tactics cards, they are all treated like cavalry. Now remember this card that I took. I, I got right at the start of the game. It needs three cavalry for it to be active. I don't have three cavalry, but if I had Genghis Khan, my infantry would count as cavalry. And then I could play this, and my, my strength would actually go even higher. This is what I'm thinking of doing. Also, at the end of your turn, you get put... Called, yeah, I'm going to take Genghis Khan. Okay. So Genghis Khan takes two actions to play, because he's from this area here. Now, playing a leader costs one action. We know that. Because I've mentioned it before, everything you do in a game costs one action or possibly more. However, the normal rules are when you replace a leader, so when you play one when you've already got one and it replaces the leader, you have to have the civil action, but you actually get the civil action back. Okay, so it's technically free in terms of actions. However, I'm saying however a lot, let's look at Homer. If you use the ability to replace Homer, you do not get the civil action back. But I think we're still going to do it. So we're going to we're going to put Genghis Khan into play. We're going to use Homer's ability. We're going to improve the Library of Alexandria, and the crowd go wild. There we go. So that you look there you go. Homer has now got that there. So basically, the happy face that Homer was generating. I've not lost it, it's just moved. It's no longer from the leader, it's now on the wonder. Okay. Now, we can now play this card. Look at my strength. My strength is now seven. If I play this, which I can, my strength has gone up to nine. Because remember, you can only have one tactics card in hand. So my old one, I haven't. It, it's still in the game. I don't have it anymore. You can see I have this one because my banner is on it. But this was my old one. Because what happened is, on the turn after I played it, it actually became publicly available. And any player can now spend two military actions to adopt any kind of tactics which somebody else has already done. Um, which we're not going to do. But basically, that's it. My strength is now nine. Okay, right. So, how are we looking? We've got one civil action left. We've got two military actions left. Shall we talk about happiness at this stage? Before we talk about happiness, just another quick shout from CGE to say thank you very much for uh, for sponsoring these videos. And CGE are giving away two codes to this game. So if you are watching this video, you can enter the contest. I will put the link on screen now so you can make a note of it. Bookmark it. You can't actually enter the contest just yet because... There you go. That is the link. CGE.as slash GR contest. If you go to that website, that is a Google form, you will be asked a series of questions. Uh, you don't have all of the answers to those questions yet, but that is the form. Go to that at the end of this video, fill in the form, and on Friday I will be picking two winners who are going to win a copy of the game. If you've already got a copy of the game, enter the contest anyway and give a copy to your friend so you can go and crush them. Uh, I mean, play against them. Yes. Right, anyway. We've got one civil action left. So happiness, that's what I was going to explain. I need a drink before I explain happiness. And I mentioned, happiness is the most difficult concept in the game to explain, so if you're sitting comfortably, the yellow bank is divided, as we know, into sections. The section determines how much food it costs you to increase your population, and it also tells you what your consumption is. Right now, I am in this column because it's empty, therefore it's going to cost me four food every time I want a new worker, and my consumption is two. Now, it's not corruption, it's consumption. There's nothing you can do about it. So every turn, if you look at this, I am actually generating three food, but two of it is being consumed. So my net gain of food is one. And if it's going to cost me four food to get a new worker, that's four turns. A normal game only lasts for 19 or 20 turns. And we're already on turn 
what, six, seven? So you're gonna to need to up your food production. Anyway, the other thing is this happy faces. You have these happy face markers at the end. I have one happy face right now because of this. Homer's legacy under the Library of Alexandria is giving me one happy face, which is what this happy face here is. Every section of the yellow bank needs to have some counters in it. And if you don't have any counters in it, you need one happy face for every empty section. I have two empty sections, I only have one happy face, which is why I have this orange mm, face. And that is because I have a spare worker here. So whenever you have an idle worker, then the requirement of a happy face for one empty slot is sort of fulfilled. It's called a discontent worker, okay? This is okay, right? I, discontent workers are not great. They don't do anything on their own, but certain event cards have a negative effect here for you, on you if you have discontent workers. But right now, I'm okay with this. The only way that I can convert this discontent worker into a happy worker is by getting another happy face. Now, right now, there's only one way I can do that, and that is by building this temple. I'm not sure whether I want to do that because that doesn't fit with my strategy, but I'm going to have to find a way of getting more happy faces at some point. You cannot survive this game with only one happy face because, look, it's going to get worse and worse, and I'm going to end up with loads of discontent workers. I'm now going to do something that's really not good and then I'm going to undo it and I'm going to show you why it's not good. I am going to go, oh, I quite like libraries. I'm going to build another library, which I can. I've got an action left. I have five rocks. I could build another library, but I'll show you what happens if I do. This goes here. Yeah, we're all happy. We're working in the library. Look at this. That orange face has now gone red. Okay. So three things in the game to talk about. One, consumption. I've mentioned that a couple of times. You can't avoid it. It just means you lose some food every turn. It's part of the game. Don't worry about it. It happens. Second thing I'm going to talk about is corruption. Corruption you want to try and avoid if you can, but it isn't the end of the world. All it means is that you'll lose a couple of resources. At the start of the game, that's really going to hurt you. So you do want to try and avoid corruption if you can. So that's consumption. That's corruption. The third thing is an uprising. You want to avoid an uprising at all costs. If you have an uprising, it's pretty much game over, okay? It's technically not. You still play the game, but you might as well not be playing the game because if you have an uprising, you don't produce. Your mines don't produce, your farms don't produce, you don't get any culture, you don't get any science. You have to avoid an uprising at all costs. And if you, if you see this red face, you are going to have an uprising. And in fact, if I was to try and end my turn now, the app won't let me. It will say, whoa, wait a minute. Are you sure about this? Because you're about to have an uprising. It's got these warning systems built into the app, which is really useful. Never, ever, ever end your turn with a red face here, is what I'm saying. I'm sure some people might put some comments in the chat to say, oh no, Paul, I've won the game after having two uprisings. Possibly. I've never seen it. If you have a red face there, you have to do everything you can to stop that red face. The only two ways of doing that are somehow getting yellow dots back in here, which we can't do, um, or by having an idle worker. Now, I could just undo that previous move. There you go, and we're fine. However, there's another way you can do it. You can disband things. Okay, so at any point in the game, you can disband something that you've built and move the worker back to here. But it costs an action. You can't just do it for free. You don't get any of the resources back. I've already spent all of my civil action. So let's say I absolutely desperately needed that second library in order to avoid this civil disorder. I can't dismantle one of these buildings because I don't have any civil actions, but I could disband a warrior. I could do that. I'm not saying it's the right thing to do, but I'm just saying that is an option. I spent one of my military actions, I disbanded a warrior, I put it back here, my military strength has gone down to eight. That's not too bad, actually. I might do this. <laughs> I actually might do this. Um, but it's now orange. Orange is okay. Remember, orange is a discontent worker. It's okay. Red is really bad. So hopefully that makes sense. 
And he, so let, let's go back. Here's the options. Do we build the library or do we just, uh, I can't increase my population. I could, mm, this, this food is bothering me. This food is really bothering me. Um, we could upgrade that. Okay, now I'm generating two food a turn, which is still not enough, but it means I can have an extra worker in two turns rather than four. So that's one option. Um, yeah, I might just leave this. I mean, we could, yeah, we could. So I, I used the example where I built a library. Oh, hang on. Let's undo that. There you go. Um, yeah, I used the example where I built a library, and that was really bad. Don't do that. But what I could do is I could actually build a temple. I could totally build a temple right now if I wanted to. And look what's going to happen. There you go, smiley face. Because remember, a temple, for every worker on a, on a temple card, you get one smiley face. So that, that is an option as well. Um, the other benefit of that is my culture output has gone up to three. And an extra three for Genghis Khan. What's this red one doing here for? Uh, I think that was Homer that we haven't used. So yeah, that, that's an option. And then I've still got two military actions left. I don't... I tend not to build temples in this game because I normally find another way of getting happy faces. Which is why... You know I said earlier on the Hanging Gardens was my favourite wonder. Look at what the Hanging Gardens does. It gives you two happy faces. So if you can build the Hanging Gardens early on in the game, you don't have to worry about happy faces for like the first third of the game. And that's why I really like it. Without that, you're going to have to find some way of getting happy faces, which could have been Bread and Circuses. That gives happy faces. Oh, what should I do? Should I... Hmm... Oh, this is painful. These decisions are painful. Do I take Bread and Circuses and suffer the discontent worker and then develop Bread and Circuses next turn or do I build the, the temple? No, I'm going to do it. I'm going to take Bread and Circuses. Yeah, we're going to take Bread and Circuses. That's what we're going to do. We're going to live with this discontent worker for this turn. Okay, am I done? Longest turn ever. Yes, I think I'm done. We're happy with military strength. We're good with that. End turn. Now, the yellow player should not play any event cards. Let's see if it does. It didn't. And the reason I'm saying it shouldn't is the yellow player knows that I've been seeding that event deck with cards. Therefore, those cards are probably going to favour me when they come out. Also, another top tip for new players. Once the age 8 event cards have gone, Remember, all of the AJ event cards are all safe and they are all got nice bonuses on them. Every other card from now on is potentially going to hurt you if you are weakest in military strength. So, if you are weakest in military strength, be very, very careful putting events into the deck. Because otherwise you're going to get hammered when they come out. And I have seen new players get absolutely destroyed in this game because they are just playing event cards... And then another one comes out that says, oh, the weakest player loses a building. Oh, the weakest player loses this. Oh, the weakest player loses this. And, I'm, and they're like, oh, this game's terrible. It's just punishing me all the time. And I'm like, well, don't put event cards into the deck there. <laughs> You're the one that's triggering this. You know, you've got to learn that. If you are behind on military strength, be very careful about putting cards into the deck. Right. Age one is over. We are now in age two, the industrial age. And you'll notice this box has just popped up. All civilizations lose two yellow tokens from their yellow banks. That's what happens at the end of age two and end of age three. Other things happen as well, but we have the Crusades. The Crusades are res are, uh, is resolving. Paul is the strongest player. Yellow is the weakest player. So I gain four culture and yellow loses four culture. Nice. There were other things that happened at the end of the age as well, but I don't think they applied to this game. I'm just going to check the log. So here's what happens. No, right. So what normally happens at the end of an age, or, well, what does happen, any leaders from age A that are still alive, they die. Any wonders under construction from age A, so if they've been built, they're fine. But if you're still in the middle of building them, sorry, you've run out of time, they fall apart. And if you had any age A cards in hand, they would now be discarded, okay? We are now in age two. 
Thank you very much to everybody for stay, bearing with me. I don't know what time it is. We're going to do this today until we've finished. It's half three. Wow. We are going to speed up a bit. Um, and um, you can play a whole game of this, although this is going to take ages today. I played a whole game of this in 20 minutes on Monday. We went shopping. Uh, me and Vicky went to Tesco. She went in to do the shopping because we're only allowed one in at a time. I sat outside and played a complete game of Through the Ages on the iPad in 20 minutes. That's how long it takes you to play a full game of this once you know what you're doing. Obviously, this is going to take longer because we're, we're talking about strategies and stuff. Right, it is my political action. What do we want to play? Let's have a look at the cards we've got. We have Raiders. Now, this is going to be good. Each of the two weakest civilizations on your turn lose food and rocks. In a three-player game, that means only one player is not going to be affected by this. And if I can maintain my strength, when this comes out, am I going to be able to? Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to try. I'm going to play it. So this is going in the deck. I get one culture for doing that. And the card that's been revealed is a developed territory. So now we're going to explain how the colonization of territories works. And this is the digital rules of the game. So you can see on screen, the way that the digital rules work for bidding is all players basically present a secret bid. And then the app works out who would have won. In the board game, where you're playing and you're all sat around the table, you basically bid. So one player will, <coughs> excuse me, one player will bid, next player will either pass or outbid them and it goes round and round and round and round until one player is left in. You can use those rules in the digital game if you want to but it does slow things down quite a lot um, especially if you're playing asynchronously. So I would recommend using the digital rules when playing asynchronously. Now here's how the bidding works. We can bid up to nine and the reason we can bid up to nine is because we have nine strength points. You'll notice the green player has six strength points, but he has two boats. The, and this is where the boats come in. Remember, he got the boats from the cartography, and I did say, like an hour and a half ago, that those that cartography is going to help him when these territories come out. Green has effectively got a plus a free plus two to his bid. So whenever green bids, if green was if green was going to spend one point of military strength, his bid is actually three. But when he wins the bid, he only has to spend one. So it, it, that's what the boats do. Now, what you're bidding with is you're actually bidding with military strength. So if I was to bid one and I was to win, for example, I would be sending one warrior over to that territory. And that warrior is gone. It goes back into my yellow bank. OK, just have a look at my yellow bank, by the way. You'll notice I've got a red smiley, a red, a red face now, because remember, at the start of age two, sorry, at the end of age one, all players lost two yellow tokens. So I'm now in trouble here. I need to do something now about this. Anyway, back to the bidding. So I could bid one. If I bid two, that would be two warriors. If I was to bid three, that would actually be a silly bid. Why would that be a silly bid? Because bidding three means that I'm sending three warriors. But whenever you send an army, you actually get the army bonus as well. And when I say army, I mean your tactics card. So if I was to send three warriors, and remember my warriors count as cavalry for the purpose of my tactics card. So if I was to send my three warriors, my bid would actually be seven. It would be the three, one, one from each warrior, plus the four from the heavy cavalry. So I could bid one or I could bid two. My next highest bid should really be seven. There's no point in me bidding four or five or six um, because they're, they're exactly the same. Uh, what do we want to do? So we, we've got to look at the situation here. See, this is the thing. If I lose this section here, this is actually a section that's divided into two halves. This half is empty. Therefore, I've got the red, the red face. If I was to bid and win that bid, those warriors, those yellow blobs, would come back and they'd go here. And that's going to fix my problem straight away. So I could bid. What is it we're bidding for? We're bidding for a developed territory that gives me one yellow blob, one blue cube, and three science. So that would be quite nice. There are, uh, there are also defence cards which you can use to bid with, but I haven't got any of those, so I can't show you those, unfortunately. Um, and we've got to try and guess what the green player is going to bid. The green player is probably going to bid four, I reckon, because he's got 
He's got a swordsman that's worth two, and he's got a free plus two. So he's probably going to bid four. Therefore, if I really want it, I'm going to have to build bid seven. If I bid seven, I'm going to have to spend three warriors. Those three warriors are going to go back here. That's going to sort out my happiness problem, but suddenly my strength is going to drop to two. So we don't want that. So I'm, I'm not going to bid seven. So I'm just going to go in with a sneaky bid of... I'm going to go in with a sneaky bid of two and see if I get it. Because again, we're playing against the AI. The green AI is not very good. We'll see what it does. So there's, I'm, I'm submitting my bid. And I've won the colony. Okay, so green should have bid and didn't because he's not a very good player. Uh, if, if that AI was on a higher difficulty setting, I am pretty sure green would have taken that. Now, here's the interesting thing. I bid two, but in the digital rules, the computer works out what your highest bid could have been. So even though I bid two, the other players, you can see the red X's here, they didn't bid. So actually, I won it for one. So I don't have to spend two, I only have to spend one. Which is a shame, because I wanted to spend two. <laughs> or do I? Let's have a think. So, this is where we do it. We drag the, that over. I'm just going to drag up temporarily. There's the one. If I drag another one, that's two. If I drag another one, it should go to seven. Yeah, there you go. Because three of them together would have been the army. So I'm just going to spend one. Yeah, no, one's fine. Because that one is going to go back to here and that's going to sort out. There you go. Oh, yeah, and then I got an extra one for the territory. This is the territory. You can see it here. This is a developed territory. So the three science is a one-off bonus. I got that. Don't get it again. And these bonuses down here, these were permanent. These aren't every round, but it means I've got, as a, as a, you know, as a player, I have one extra yellow blob. Because <clears throat> normally you don't get them. These these blobs move around from here to here. You don't spend them and put them in a bank. You spend them and put them back in your bank. But that territory there actually gave me an extra yellow blob and an extra blue blob. Right, so that was my political, po political action. We have lots of resources. Look at this. We can't take Leonardo because we have Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan is an age one leader. So I can't take another age one leader. Remember, you can only have one leader from each age. We wanted to play Bread and Circuses. This is going to sort out. We, we've got a bit of corruption going on, which again is not the end of the world, but we want to try and avoid it if we can. We've got all these resources here. We've got nine science. Oh, look at this. Yeah, I want to do lots of things this turn. I think... I think we're going to play Bread and Circus. Yeah, let's do this. Let's build up a home infrastructure. Oh, the other thing we've not got either so many things going on in this game. I still only have three bronze mines. Okay? I have lots of rocks right now, but let's just have a look. I'm going to get behind soon. Yeah, nobody's producing any more than three right now. Three's not enough. You're going to be wanting to produce like 10, 15 a turn. Um, I could take the iron here, but the reason why I'm not going to take this iron is this is an age one card. We are now in age two. Taking your iron near the end of age one is like mm, because coal's coming up soon it's still in the deck coal is still in the deck but it's coming up at some point so i'm going to hold out for coal because you don't have to go uh bronze iron coal oil you don't you don't have to do it. you can skip levels um so anyway what we're going to do we're going to play the bread and circuses that costs three science we're then going to build one. If we look at Bread and Circuses, each worker on Bread and Circuses generates one military strength and two happy faces. Because people like killing each other. So we're going to put that on there. See, the re it's gone red temporarily. This face has gone red. But as soon as I put it on there, there you go. We've got two happy faces. So that's actually my happiness sorted for here as well. I can now take these two safely and we're okay. Remember, each vertical section has to have something in it or you need a happy face. So I can take these two out, that's fine. I could even take that one out, that would be fine as well. But as soon as I take that one out, that's when I have a problem. Okay, how are we gonna sort out the corruption? Uh, we haven't got enough food, so we can't have another worker yet. So I'm probably gonna upgrade this farm. Yeah, I'm gonna upgrade this farm, that costs two rocks. That sorted out the corruption and it means that we're generating more food now. Um, I haven't got any other workers. I could disband something, but I'm not going to. 
So I've got one action left. What am I going to take? Do I want to take Drama? See, Drama's another interesting card because it generates lots of culture. But again, it's an age one card. I don't want to be taking an age one card this late. I'm going to take Reserves. Or do I take Frugality? If I take Frugality, we've not seen many of these action cards yet. Frugality allows you to increase your population and after paying the food cost, gain two. But I'm not going to be able to do that next turn. Because I'm only going to have three food and it needs four. So if I take Frugality, I won't be playing it next turn. I could take Reserves, which is basically get two rocks or two food. I could use that, play the two food, use that two food to get another worker. I could do that. What other options do I have? It's either Frugality Reserves. I don't really want to take Iron or Drama. I'm going to take the Reserves. Yeah, taking the Reserves. Okay, now, at this point, I'm going to talk about the Urban Building Limit. We haven't talked about this before, but I'm going to talk about it now. Let's have a look at these cards. Right, these are farms, these are mines. You can have any number of them. These are not urban buildings. Okay, they are farms and mines, they are brown cards, and you can have any number of those that you want. However, the urban buildings, you have a limit, and that limit is shown here. Your starting government card has an urban building limit of two. So I can only have two of each type of building. And when I say type, I actually mean category. I mean the thing that's in the top right. So I can only have two arenas. I can only have two libraries. I can have two temples and I can have two labs. If I had multiple cards of a type, that isn't two on each card, it's two in total. So I could have another bread and circuses, I could have another printing press, I could have another philosophy. Though at this stage in the game, there's no point in me building this one. In fact, at some point, if I had spare actions, I would be disbanding this and rebuilding it over here because it's actually better over here. Um, but anyway, we're done. Are we going to play any military actions? We don't have any spare workers, so we can't build anything. I don't want to disband. We don't want to play any of these tactics. Although I could play this one. This is interesting. Because remember, because I'm Genghis Khan, my infantry counters cavalry, if I want them to. So by playing this medieval army, if I was to play it, my four infantrymen, two of them would act as cavalry, and I would actually get this twice. Okay? And which would be exactly the same as me getting the four from this one. So it wouldn't actually make any difference right now. So I'm not going to. I'm not going to play that. I'm definitely not going to play that one. So I think that's it. I think that's the end of my turn. Yeah. Let's just check. I'm not corrupted. We're okay. End turn. Right. Production. Yeah. So my next objective, I think, is... We've sorted the happiness out. I need to be generating more rocks. Hmm. Oh, and actions. I'm going to need more actions because we're still on a despot empire. Uh, the government cards, by the way, are the orange cards. We've seen a couple of them come out, but they've passed me by. But yellow has just taken one. Oh, Reign of Terror. Excellent. So yellow loses a population. Take that yellow. Oh, the scientific method is a very good card. Look at that. Green science output has just rocketed up to four. Okay, so let's talk about government cards. Yellow has now got a new government, which is Theocracy. It gives one extra military action, it gives one happy face, it gives one military strength, and it generates one culture, which is much better than my despotism. Green's still despotism as well. Yeah, okay, right, what are we gonna do? Oh, look at this. We have some new pacts. Uh, the old pact is still in play. Oh, I'd forgotten about that. <laughs> Completely forgotten. I'm not drawing any aggression cards. This is a bit disappointing. I was hoping to have drawn some aggression cards. But we have these options. I've got another pact. Now, you can only have one pact between you and another player that you proposed. So right now, I have a pact with the green player that I proposed. If I propose another pact with the green player, I can. But if they accept, the first pact disappears. Alternatively, Green could propose a pact with me, and that would be fine. We would have two pacts with each other, each of us proposing one. Or I could propose a pact with the yellow player, and they could accept that, and I would have two pacts, one, in, one with each player. 
I could play scientific cooperation and this is one again you need to be very careful about because it allows the players to basically spend each other's science and it, sometimes if you play this and another player accepts they then end up using it more than you and they end up benefiting far more than you did. You want to generally play this card when you are when you are ahead on science and you're generating more science. So let's have a look at what our opponents are doing. Yellow is generating two science and doesn't have very much. Green is generating four science. So I probably don't want to cooperate with green. And if I did, I'd lose the previous pact. The question is, am I going to be able to use this this turn? Basically, it gives you a discount of two science on every technology card you play, but the other player pays one. So if I was able to play this... Oh, if Cole was out, oh, I'd be totally taking this. But Cole is not out. I don't think I want any of these cards. So I'm not going to play that. Let's have a look at the other one. Promise of military protection. So Civilization A. So when you propose a pact, you choose, if it's asymmetrical, you choose who is A and who is B. So if I proposed this, I would say to Yellow, would you like a promise of military protection? I will be A and you will be B. B is going to get plus four to strength, but produces one culture less. Now, unfortunately, that means yellow strength is going to go up to 10. Now, what's yellow going to do? Yellow doesn't look like it's building any military units anytime soon. Am I? Well, I, I might. Yeah, I'm not sure, actually. Oh... Or do we put another territory into the deck, knowing now that the green player is a bit stupid and, and doesn't bid when it should? Um, so do we take advantage of that and put another card in the deck? I think I'm going to do that. I'm going to put this strategic territory into the deck. And we've revealed the vast territory, the other one. So we get another bidding round. Now, how much do I want to bid this time? Again, I haven't drawn any defence bidding cards. That's a shame, because I wanted to show you this this aspect of the game. There are basically these um, defence cards that you can get in your hand, um, and whenever there's a bidding, you can use them to bid. I haven't drawn any of those, um, so that's a shame. And also, I haven't drawn many aggression cards yet, so I'm, we're not seeing the military aspect of the game too much. We saw green did an attack on yellow, but yeah, we haven't seen it in great detail. So I'm going to bid... Now, bear in mind it's my turn. So if I win this bid, I think I might be able to rebuild. I'm tempted to build to bid two and see what happens. Again, I won the colony because green isn't very good at the game. Uh, and I, I only won it with one. So there we go. I've colonized with one. This gets me three food immediately. I get three yellow tokens permanently, so that's going to be awesome. That's really going to help this situation. But I lose one blue cube because I've got maintenance, basically, of the territory. So that blue cube has gone permanent, which means I'm more prone to corruption. Uh, I, I've got to spend some of this stuff. Now, I need to check my military strength. I'm still the highest, so that's okay. But yes, we need to spend resources. Now, one good way of spending resources is wonders. Wonders cost a huge amount of resources to build. The Kremlin is available. It costs four, then four, then four, and it actually gives an unhappy face. But it gives two culture per turn, uh, and it gives uh, a white and a red. So I, I get one extra civil action and one extra military action. Really good card. As is Napoleon. Um, Napoleon's not actually that good for me in the current situation. I just don't want somebody else to get him. What are my other options? Well, let, let's have let's go through it. Let's experiment with a few things and see what happens. I'm going to increase my population. Or oh, can do it twice. Okay. And then I could build another bread and circus, which I don't need. I don't need the extra happy faces just yet. So I'm going to put one of those. Okay, so there's the corruption sorted. Let's check what's going on here. Um, okay, so we've got one action left. We're all right for corruption. I could take a card. Don't want to take alchemy at this stage. No, because I've gone down the library route. I don't want to take architecture because that's actually an upgrade for masonry. So I'd lose masonry and get architecture in place. But I think I'm fine with that. Uh, I really didn't need the reserves, did I? 
Um, we could build some more military units. Yes, we could. If we want to. I think we do. So we're going to build another military unit. We've still got one civil action left. Um, so I'll, I'll play reserves. Now normally I wouldn't play reserves as the last action because that would put you in corruption sometimes. But I think I'm going to do it. I'm going to play reserve to get two food. Now interestingly, I'm gaining two food. And a lot of people think, well that's going to be two blue cubes. It's not. It's one. Because remember, every blue every blue blob thing on here is actually worth two food. So yeah, you can be efficient with the use of cubes. Right, I think we're done. It's time to talk about hand size. I'm surprised we've gone this long and I've not talked about hand size, but that's because I've been playing around it. You have two two type you, you have two hands in this game. You have a civil hand of cards and you have a military hand of cards. Your civil hand of cards, the number of cards that you are allowed maximum is equal to the number of civil actions you have in total. Doesn't matter how many you've spent. So I have uh, four, I have the capability of four civil actions, therefore my civil hand size is four. And you can never exceed that. You are not allowed to take cards above your hand size. Your military hand size is done slightly different. Your military hand size is based on the number of military actions that you have, which is three, but you can go over it at the end of your turn before the start of your next end of turn sequence. We are about to end my turn, and at that point, that is when it checks for the hand limit. And I'm going to have to discard down to three cards, but then I will draw two more. So basically, you can go over your hand size when it is not your turn. So, I'm going to click end of turn now. I'm just checking. We're all right for corruption. We've done that. Yep, end turn. And here we go, discard phase. It's telling us we need to discard two. Uh, why two? When I said it was going to be three, because of the library. Okay. One bonus about the library that I haven't mentioned yet is I can now keep one extra civil card and one extra military card in hand. So my military hand limit is actually four. Now, which of these do I want to get rid of? Um, why? Okay, normally I would be discarding the territory at this stage, but green is stupid, so I'm going to keep that in hand. Um, I think we're going to get rid of this one at this stage. And I think I'm going to get rid of this one. I'm going to keep this one. Even though it's actually useless to me right now, this is quite a good card should the cannons come up and I get them. Yes. Okay, right. Uh, we are done, I believe. So, production. Yeah, I'm happy with the food generation now. Oh, and I've finally drawn some aggression cards. I'm probably not going to be able to use them. Uh-oh, Napoleon's just arrived. Hello. Yeah, let's, let's have a look at the situation now. Once Green's taken his turn. How are we doing? 35 cards left. Uncertain Borders. Now, this is another card. Is it, did I put this in? No, I didn't. I didn't put this card in. Somebody else put this in. I think Green put this in. So the strongest civilization, me, takes one yellow token from the weakest civilization's bank, which is Green. So that backfired on Green. And now look at what's happened. Oh. Oh, wow. Green is destroying its stuff. Yeah, it's playing really badly. <laughs> it's probably going to win. It's building the diversity. And it's done. More corruption. So, when it's my turn, we're just going to have a look at this event deck. Because I lied to you earlier on. I said earlier on, when the current event deck runs out, you shuffle the future events and make a new current event deck. That's not true. It's not strictly true. If the future event has a mix of cards from ages, and it does, it has three age one cards and two age two cards, you shuffle those two separately, and the age one events go on top of the age two events. So all of the age ones will come out first, and then the age twos. And remember, it's telling us, I put in this, and I put in this, and I put in that, and, and then green put the other three in. So we don't know what green's put in, but that's what's in the event deck. Okay, so it is my political action. And finally, we now have war cards and aggression cards. Very, very exciting, but I'm probably not going to play them, and I'm going to explain why. So, the military aspect of this game is quite high, but you can actually have an entire game of this 
where there is no attacks whatsoever. It's all about the threat of attacks and it's all about, and this is probably how long are we in now to the video, two hours into the video and I'm getting to the most important thing about this game is do not get behind on military strength, okay? If you have a military strength of one and the other player has a military strength of two, you're fine. But if you've got a military strength of one and they've got a military strength of 15 or 30 or whatever, it's, it's game over. Right, you are going to get absolutely hammered. Now it, it does rely on them drawing the aggression and the war cards, but eventually they will. And if you've got the lowest military strength in a four-player game, you're going to get crushed. That's that's just the game. Now let's have a look at our military strength here. I'm on nine, yellow's on eight, green's on six. They're fairly close together. And the reason why I'm saying that I'm probably not going to play this card is I don't think it's going to work. I'm going to show you how. I'm going to talk you through the process and explain why I don't think it's going to work. Um, when I play this card, first of all, it's going to cost me my political action. So I've used my political action to play the card. It's also going to cost me two of my military actions, which means I've only got one military action left, which means I'm only going to draw one more card or I'm only going to get to build one thing. So it's actually going to cost me something to play the card. If it doesn't work, it's a waste of time. And the reason why I'm saying it's not going to work is you compare strengths, so it would be 9 versus 6 if I was to attack green, but the defender can defend themselves. And this is where the defence cards come in. I mentioned that there are defence cards in the game, but if you don't have defence cards, you can actually discard any other military card for one point of defence. The most number of cards you can actually use in defence is equal to the number of military actions that you have. So right now, green is three points behind on strength. Green has three military actions. If I did an aggression card, green could just throw away three random, well not random, but it, it would choose and discard three of its military cards and then it would be fine. And I don't think that's worth it. Now sometimes it might be. Sometimes you might think, oh yeah, Green's probably got some good cards, I might hurt his choice. But the chances are, Green, you can see here, you can see exactly what he's got in hand. He's got one age one card, four age, five age two cards. The chances are he can probably throw three of them away and, and not blink an eyelid. So I'm not going to play the aggression. If Green had four strength or five strength, I'd be tempted. Because I'd be taking a gamble on whether it's got any defence cards, and it probably does, because I don't and the six defence cards in each deck. And we are halfway through the deck, so those defence cards must be somewhere. Again, it's all about knowing the cards, knowing the card mix, playing the odds. The other option is the war, uh, and at this stage in the game, I don't think I'm going to play this card. I don't think so. Let's just have a look at the situation and see what Green's about to do. Green's in a bit of trouble. Yeah, Green is in a bit of trouble. I don't think Green's going to be increasing his military strength anytime soon. Maybe I will. Maybe I will. Right, can I expand my empire? Oh, oh, hello. There's a cannon. Oh, but there's coal. Oh, I was tempted then for a minute. If I take the cannon, play the cannon, build one, which I can, that would work. But if I miss this coal, yeah, so... The reason I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about the war cards is war cards are not resolved straight away. Aggressions are. You play the aggression, you do it, it's resolved, it's finished. The war card, you, prepare, you, you, you declare war, you then take your turn, everybody else then takes a turn, and at the start of your next turn, then the war is resolved. So you've got to be very careful it doesn't backfire. Because an aggression is, I'm attacking you, if it works, I get something, if it doesn't work, nothing happens. A war is, we're both fighting each other, and whoever wins the war, which could be you. Even though I declared war on you, it could be you. So you've got to be very careful when you declare war that the other player then doesn't just suddenly ramp up their military strength. And I am definitely not declaring war against Napoleon. So, I'm not going to play the aggression. I'm not going to play the war over technology. What do we want to do? Do we want to do scientific cooperation? Do we do scientific cooperation with yellow? Hmm, what's it going to enable me to do? If I do, I will be able to play coal for five this turn instead of that. Oh, you know what? 
You know what? I could. If I do the scientific cooperation, and I do it, I could take Republic, play it for nine. Oh, I still don't have to play that. Because we're, we're still here. We're still in a despot. And at this point, I need to be changing. Because I'm... I'm yeah, I'm, I'm getting behind on actions. If you look at Republic... It's got seven civil actions. I'm currently only on four. Ah, oh, choices, choices. Do we put another territory into the deck? <laughs> um, okay, I'm, I'm going to put another territory into the deck. Because I'm ahead on strength. Let's brave it. After all that... Okay, strategic territory has come out. Well, I'm going to bid one. Because I don't really want this. But if I get it for one... I'm going to grab it. I, I, oh, should I be looking at the other players? No, that's fine. I'm going to bid one. And I've won the colony. Now, interestingly, yellow bid one as well this time. But because I I was going first, I got I, I basically broke the ties. Um, if yellow would have bid two, yellow would have got the colony. So there we go. I'm getting some really cheap colonies now because the green player, I've set the AI to be really bad. So, yeah, we're going to colonise this. Now, the immediate bonus is I get to draw three military cards and I get a permanent bonus of plus two strength. And there you go. Hey, we've got one of these defence cards. So these are the defence cards that I've talked about. They are two uses, which is why there's a slash. You can play it for defence, where you get the number at the top. And all of the age two cards are for defence. Or you can play it when colonising to give you the bonus that's at the bottom in boats. But when you're, when you're colonising... You can't win just with boats. Somebody has to get on the boat to plant the flag. Um, so you you have to send at least one military unit. Anyway, I've drawn a defence card, which is no good for me as a defence card, because nobody's going to attack me. So we are now in my civil actions. So what are we going to do? I think we're going to take coal. I was very, very tempted by constitutional monarchy. And I still am. Oh, if I take that and play it, my science is going to go down to one, and then I'm going to miss out on coal next turn. Oh, can we survive for much longer without coal? But then again, can I survive much longer with only four actions? This is tricky. And we've got these breakthrough cards. These are really good. These action cards allow you to... You play the breakthrough card, you develop a technology for nor the normal cost, but then you get science back. Really good if you're short on the science. Four actions, wow. I mean, James Cook is also a really good leader. See, I've got, how many colonies have I got? I've got three, I've got three territories. James Cook is gonna give me points. Yeah, so your first colony produces two culture. Every If I had James Cook, I'm gonna be producing four culture return just from having James Cook. I'm gonna try and get James Cook next time. Hopefully he'll still be there because he's not actually that good for anybody else because nobody else has a territory. Do we take the coal? Do we take the cannon? Do we take the constitution or might Oh. Ooh. I'm gonna take the coal. I'm taking the coal. I'm playing the coal. And then I'm gonna upgrade. Now upgrading this time costs eight. It costs six. See this costs eight, this costs two. So the cost of upgrading that to that is six which I have. That's sorted out the corruption problem. We are now generating five rocks every turn. That's a, a lot better than three. How else are we looking? We've no more civil actions left. So am I happy with that? We're not corrupted. The happiness situation is totally under control now because we colonized these territories that gave us extra people. So that's that. That's all, that's all good. Um, I think that's it. That's all I did. Doesn't seem very much, but I think I'm going to do that. So we end turn, Genghis earns three points because I have... And discards. Right, what do we want to discard? Hmm. What do we want to discard? Hmm. I'm having to discard four cards. <laughs> Um, okay, let's have a look at this one. The weakest civilization loses a colony if they have a colony. So that's not going to hurt the other people. So I think we're going to get rid of that one. 
Popularization of science. Popularization of each civilization scores culture equal to its science rating. It's nice. Um, do we get rid of the war or do we get rid of the aggression? I think we're going to get rid of the promise of military protection. I don't think I'm going to use that. Um, oh, which cards to get rid of? You can actually click on them and look at them here and then cycle through them. Is cannon still going to be there when it's my turn? That is the question. I'm hoping it is. So I'm going to keep fortifications. I might keep the scientific cooperation and offer that to Green in the hope that it says yes. That's already marked for discarded. Do we play this war? I'm probably going to get discard either uh, the aggression uh, or the war card. I'm not sure which. I don't think the aggression is going to work because we're too close on strength and both of the other players have a whole handful of cards. So I'm going to discard that. Still got one more to discard. I don't want to discard this because it's my only event card and I want to be playing event cards to populate this. So I think I'm going to discard the defence card. Now I never ever do this in multiplayer. Yeah, I, I never do this because in multiplayer I will be bidding for those territories when they come out. But in this game, based on what the way that Green is playing, I'm just going to get rid of that. So there you go. That is my four cards that I've discarded. Ouch, that's painful. Okay, production. Three food, five rocks, four science, three culture. And Genghis wrote a book. Yellow is destroying temples. Okay, so it's destroyed a temple to build another lab. Yellow is building the Eiffel Tower. Okay, yellow is corrupted as well. How is, uh, how is yellow doing for... Oh, oh, we've got a pact. Green is offering me a pact. So green is offering me a pact, which basically says green is going to produce an extra rock and I am going to produce an extra food. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Pact accepted. There you go. So we have two pacts in play between our great empires. One proposed by me, one proposed by green. We're best of friends. We don't like yellow. Okay. How are we doing? 26 cars left for Mage 2 probably need to be speeding up because <laughs> otherwise we're going to be here for a long time i thought this might be a 90 minute stream today but it's not um so politics what are we going to do with politics i mean i have explained pretty much most of the rules now we still don't want to play the aggression we still don't want to play the war oh i did get a new aggression i'm going to play this card national pride and this is another controversial card because what a lot what you know a bad thing in games is that something happens that allows the player to get ahead to get even further ahead okay that is generally frowned upon in games however that's exactly what this card does the civilization with the most culture gets an extra five culture the reason why in this game is it, it's okay is that you are taking a little bit of a gamble you are putting it in the deck and if you are not the one with the most culture when it comes out then it's backfired and you lose out on it so i think based on the current situation which i'm just going to show you I currently have 37 culture and I'm producing three a turn. Uh, the other two aren't near me, so I'm hoping that I've still got the most culture by the time this comes out. Also, note, that is an age two card. Remember what I said at the start? You get one culture point per level, uh, or for the age of the card. So at the start of the game, I was putting age one cards into the event deck and getting one culture every time. That was an age two card, so as I played it as a future event, I got two culture. What just happened? Oh, we, we all got some culture based on science. Yeah. So let's just have a look. We know uh, there's a Raiders in there and there's two other... Oh, we know that Raiders is next. Yeah, because Raiders is the only remaining age one card in the current event deck. And I know it's there and I know I put it in. So that is coming out next. So we know that. Right, my turn. What are we going to do? Uh, what is our plan? I think our plan is to just try and ramp up production. I can't right now because it costs six rocks. Um, am I desperate for doing anything else? I don't think I am. But look at this. James Cook has come down, as has the cannon. I think we're going to take James Cook. We're going to lose Genghis Khan. My military strength is going to be absolutely crippled by this. 
So maybe I should have kept that defense card. <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd forgotten that. Yeah, Genghis Khan was given the ability to use my infantry as cavalry. So as soon as I bring James Cook into play, which I'm going to do, he replaces Genghis Khan. Remember, I get the action back. My military strength has gone down to six. Why is it six? It's three for the warriors. Uh, one from the arena. And two because of Malta. Here. This strategic territory. So that's why it's six. Okay, so I'm now the weakest. We need, we need to do something about that. Don't panic. And we can. We're going to take cannon. I have a plan. We're going to develop cannon, we're going to increase my population, and we're going to build one of them, because I think they cost five. Yes, it just so happens that I have five. And that increases my strength to nine. Okay, so I have this tactics in play. I have heavy, cav heavy cavalry is my current tactics. It's, it's not doing anything, because I don't have three cavalry. What I could do, if I wanted to, <clears throat> I could... Uh, spend two military actions and go back to this one. And that would boost my strength by two. I don't think I'm going to. I think I'm going to draw two cards. Or do I want to draw two cards? Ooh. It's either that and my strength will go up to 11. Because I'm going to replace it with, the, the, with this one next turn. I'm going to, next turn I'm going to build another cannon. And I'm going to then play this... Um, fortifications tactic. That's my plan for next turn. So, is it worth me spending two military actions this turn to give me a bit of a boost? I don't think it is. Let's just have a look. Oh no, it is because of raiders. No, it is. Absolutely is because of raiders. I'm glad I remembered that. So yeah, I'm going to use two military actions to adopt legion. There you go. So my strength is now 11, and I am done. I have to discard some cards. What are we going to discard? Oh, well, I'm, I'm going to keep the war, and I'm going to keep the aggression. And I am going to discard the defence card. <laughs> um, I think I'm going to discard the scientific cooperation as well. Yeah. Again, difficult choices. There we go. Government's a problem. Right, so Raiders has come out, which I knew. So yellow and green lose some stuff. But not me, because I'm the strongest. Yeah, I think... Yeah, I can just see messages in the chat about monarchy and monarchy and... Yeah, monarchy and James Cook is possibly what I should have taken. Um, yeah, switching to a government... I, I think I've probably switched government too late. But every game plays out differently, as I've said. I've gone with... Um, I'm going to try and do something with the military aspect. We are bidding for another territory. It is an inhabited territory, which again gives three extra people and you immediately get two of them for free. So we actually want this. And I could, if I wanted to, bid with the cannon, but then I lose the cannon. Don't, don't do that. Bit. I'm going to bid what? Excuse me. Am I going to bid any more than one? Yeah, I am. I'm going to bid two. Let's see if I get it. I haven't got any uh, boosty cards for boats, so... We're just bidding two. We'll see what happens. Uh, green won the col. Oh, excuse me. Green won the colony with three. Now remember, green has two boats, uh, which means it only needs to pay one. So it's colonising it with one warrior. Oh, it's actually a swordsman, but yeah, so it should have bid four. And then green is taking some cards. Green got a colony. Rats. Uh, if you're in the chat, tell me how many colonies have you had at most? I played one game once where I think I had either eight or nine. Um, it was an astonishing game and I did manage to get James Cook. Um, but yeah, let me know in the chat how many colonies you've had at most in a single game. Right, it's my go. How are we for strength? We don't have enough of a strength to do something yet, so are we going to play this event card? We don't know what this is. This is an unknown event card. Uh, let's have a look at the science output. Science output is 4, 3 and 5. I think I'm safe to play that. Yeah, I'm going to stick this in. I get two points just for playing it. And the event is... It's another territory. <laughs> wow! There's a lot of territories in this game. 
Um, that's because I've been putting them in the deck and Green's been putting them in the deck. Now, do we want this one a bit more? Um, I think I might bid three for this. Yeah, I'm going to bid three. Oh, it's actually five. Yeah, it's it's three because of my three swordsmen and then an extra two because I am sending an army. Let's bid five and see if we get it. We didn't. Wow, look at this. Yellow got it for six. Yeah, that is a really good territory, that one. So yellow bid six, which means yellow is discarded. That which was one, that which was three, and a plus two boat. So there you go. There's the six that yellow spent. Now look what's happened to yellow's defense. Yellow's military strength is down to four. So at this point in the game, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the bidding that you need to be aware of. When you're bidding for a, a territory, like you've just seen here, you don't just want to be looking at, oh, how much is this worth to me? You need to be looking where you are in the turn order. Right, so this was my turn, okay, when the territory got revealed. So if I'd have won it, I would have had an opportunity to rebuild. If yellow had have won it, it's actually, you see this military strength here, four, you might think, oh, wow, that's really dangerous. It's yellow's turn next. So yellow, yellow knows, because I've had my political action, and you can only attack with a political action, that yellow is not going to get attacked now before its turn. Green, however, let's say that green decided to really bid for that territory and win it, and let's say green strength went down to like two or three. They're vulnerable to an attack from yellow. So you need to look at, when the, whenever there's a bidding for a territory, you need to look at the situation, you look at where you are in the turn sequence, and think, oh, okay, well, I could get this, but if I do, I might then get attacked by this person. So yeah, you've got to, you've got to take that into account. Right, my go. We, we had a plan. It was to increase my population, spend five resources on building another cannon, and then bring in this tactics into play. Okay, so instead of Legion, which isn't getting me anything, look at that, 17. How is it 17? Nine because of five military units. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, five from the army using the fortifications tactic. Here we go. If I have two cannons, I get five. I'll explain the three later. So two cannons is five. Uh, one from my arena and two from my strategic territory. So there you go. I've got 17 military strength. Hopefully, I'm going to be able to start doing something with that soon. How are we doing for science? We've got 12 science. Oh, look! Constitutional monarchy is there. We can do it. Oh, yes. I've got, I, I'm not going to miss it this time. Right, I'm going to take the card, and now I'm going to explain how you change government. You'll notice in the top left there are two costs. There are two ways to change government in this way. In this game, you can have a peaceful way, uh, which you pay the top cost, which is always higher, and that costs you one civil action. In this case, it'll cost one civil action and 12 science, and the, the new card comes into play. Or you can do a revolution. The revolution is the bottom cost. When you do a revolution, uh, you basically spend all of your civil actions, and it has to be the first civil action that you do. So I've already taken civil actions. I can't now do anything else. Uh, I, I can't do the revolution, so I am going to develop this peacefully. But da, 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 there you go. The change is immediate. So my despot empire is gone. We now have constitutional, constitutional monarchy. So instead of having four civil actions, I have six. And it remembers how many you've spent. So I'd already spent four of them, which means I've still got two left. And my military actions is now four because of that and an extra one because of this pact that we proposed like 2,000 years ago, but it's still valid. Right, I've got two civil actions left. It's, it's looking good now. I'm happy with this. We do need some more rocks. We do need some more, we need more of everything, but these are doing okay. Uh, we could take journalism, which is the next one up, but we need more science. And if you look at this, urban building limit is now three. So I can actually have three of these labs, uh, sorry, three of these libraries. Oh, navigation is nice. Navigation is what Green has been using, or, well, cartography. Navigation is a better version of cartography. Uh, we have a wealthy territory coming up, because I put it in there. I'm not going to be able to play that next turn. Th this is the danger, remember what I said ages ago, about don't take too many cards. If I take navigation now, I can't play it next turn. 
because it costs six science and I only have I have zero and I'm only getting four and I don't want to take cards that I can't play there is this this is the transcontinental railroad we all like trains this means that my best mind produces an extra blue token and gives me an extra five military strength okay do we take this that is going to sap my resources a lot but I think I'm going to take it What's my other options? Take reserves? No, I think we're going to take the Transcontinental Railroad for my remaining two actions. Okay, end turn. Next turn, I am going to do an aggression or a war card. We'll see when we get there. But we are going to see it in this game. Now, what's your... Oh, the territory's come out for bidding. Excellent. So I'm going to bid... Hmm. Now, I don't think yellow's going to bid on this. What's, ye what's yellow actually got that yellow can bid with? Yellow has one soldier left, one warrior, so he can bid. Green has got, yeah, green can bid as well. And I don't want to drop my strength down too much. I've no, I've no uh, defense or colonization card, so I'm going to bid one. Can we bid two? Yeah, it's bid two. Green won it with two. And that is because green is next in the turn sequence. It's yellow, it's yellow's turn. So the, so the breaking the ties would be yellow, then green, then blue. So green got it. There's something I forgot. Ah, rats. James Cook has got a special ability. I'm kicking myself now. Playing too fast. Forgot to use it. Yeah. That, that's my fault there. James Cook, when colonising, I could have discarded military cards to get colonisation points. So that, that's my bad. I forgot about that. Rats. Now who's playing bad? Okay, what is yellow doing? I'm hearing lots of temple building noises. Uh, yellow took organised religion, developed organised religion. Okay. National pride, it's come out. So the player with the most culture, which is me, gets another five. There we go. Right, green is playing uh, cards. Green is taking coal. It's a bit late for that. We're almost at the end of age two, and then we're going to go into age three. Wow. Well, I hope everybody's enjoying this. It is taking a lot longer than I thought, but, yeah, hopefully it's been useful to people. And don't forget about the contest. Let's put the contest up on screen, even though you can't enter it yet. There you go. cge.as slash grcontest. Go to that website at the end of this video, or if you're watching this back afterwards, um, because there are questions in the contest which you can't answer yet. Well, some of them you can, but some of the answers you won't have yet. You won't have them until the end of the video. Um, but yeah, CGE are giving away two codes for a copy of the game. If you've already got the game, please enter the contest anyway, because you can always gift it to a friend. Right. Green's turn. No, that was Green's turn. My turn. Fortifications becomes public. Politics phase. Right, let's start seeding some events. Or are we going to do this? Now, unfortunately, they built up their defences. So I said I was going to do a war. But actually, let's look at the situation. Yellow is on 11 strength and has six age two military cards in hand. So could potentially have... An, and an age two defence card is four and it can play four cards. So I'm working out this here. If it's got a defence card, that's four. And then it can just throw another three cards away, or another two cards away, that's six, and it would defend itself. Green is in the same position. Green could defend itself if it had a defence card. So if I was to do my aggression on either yellow or green, I'm taking a gamble that they don't have a defence card in hand. And if they do, then it was a waste of time. Wars, however, are different. Because there are no defence cards in war. You can't play defence cards. It is just a straight, you look at the two different nation so I, I'm tempted to play the war over technology because I am short on science and um, I do want to see wars even if it might backfire but I've also got this cold war which I want to play as well <sighs> war over technology or, <clears throat> or cold war if I was to play the war over technology and attack yellow is yellow the person I should attack oh I don't know, actually. Let's have a close look. Right, yellow has one unit of cavalrymen, 
one unit of riflemen has only got four rocks, so we can't build either of those two next turn, because both of those two cost five. Because what you've got to look at when you're declaring war is you've got to think, what is the other player going to be able to do to build up their defences to try and, you know, win the war back? So I don't think yellow is going to be able to win the war. Green. Green's got wave of nationalism. Green, green could use that card to build military units. I think we're going to declare war on yellow. So here we go. We are going to see a war card. This is not an aggression card. This is a war card. So we're going to declare war on yellow. Confirm. Okay, so the war has been declared. What happens, you'll notice the sky, this is a nice touch, the sky has now gone a shade of red. Okay, that means war has been declared and at the start of my next turn, before I do anything else, well, after I've done the card row, before I do any actions, the war will be resolved. Okay, so I need to try and make sure that I'm in a position where I have the most strength at the start of my next turn. And how can we do that? <laughs> I can't. Um, I could build another... Oh, I totally could. Yeah, let, let's... Let's do it. I can't take any cavalrymen or riflemen. I could increase my population and I could spend my five resources on building another cannon. Look at that. 20 strength. Okay, yeah, that's that's going to hurt yellow now. I don't think he's going to be able to recover from that. So let's concentrate on what I'm doing, which is Transcontinental Railroad. Let's take Engineering Genius which allows me to build a stage of a wonder for four less. In other words, that's one stage for free. But remember, the yellow cards, you can't play them on the turn that you get them. But I'll play that next turn. Uh, I could do with reserves. Reserves is here. Do I want to spend three to take it? I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm very tempted because I am short on reserve. I am short on rocks at the moment. And this would get me out of that. I don't want any of these. I don't want any of these. I kind of want this one. But, no, I, oh, and this is what I was saying right at the start. You might think, oh, it's three actions. I'm not going to spend three actions on taking one card. But sometimes, if that's the exact card that I need right now, because of what that's going to let me do next turn, I think I'm going to take it. My other option was frugality, but then I'd have two actions left and I'm not sure what to do with them. I could take urban growth and build... Urban growth allows you to build an urban building cheaper or upgrade. Um, so I could do that as well. Actually, yeah, let's let's do that. Because that allows me to build that for free, which is kind of like having the, the rocks. Okay, yeah, I've talked myself out of it. I'm going to take frugality and I'm going to take urban growth. There's another thing in the game as well that I'm going to mention at this point. The game ends when the age three deck is empty and all players have played one more round. You can very slightly manipulate the length of the game. What I've done is I have just taken two cards from the row instead of one. That means, yeah, more are gonna slide down. So if I'm trying to rush the end of the game, that's what I wanna be doing. That's what I've done. I've not got any more things to do with my military action. So I have two military actions left. My military hand size is five. Don't forget my civil hand size is now seven. Six because of these and one because of the library. So we're done. Production. Four food, five rocks, four science, seven culture. It's looking good. It is looking good. We are now in age three. This is the 20th century. Uh, so green has lost the university because it didn't finish building it in time. The open borders agreement disappears. Yeah, pacts that are two ages old disappear. Green discards the card. Yeah, that's all good. We're all fine. The yellow is building the Eiffel Tower. I'm glad of that. I'm glad it's spending its resources building a tower. Because I'm now going to win that war. Huzzah! As I say, you can go whole games where there's no war and there's no aggressions. It's all down to the players and how close they keep to each other. Right, Ravages of Time. Now this is an event, this is an interesting one. Which on the surface looks bad and isn't. All civilizations must choose a completed wonder from either age A or age 1 and it crumbles. And it no longer produces the effect that it produces, but instead it produces two culture. So 
at this point in the game, you need to be generating culture. To be honest, if I was playing this game against good opponents, I would not be stand any chance of winning, I don't think. Um, because in the latter part of the game, you need to be ramping up your culture output. In fact, I've got seven. That's not too bad. Um, so actually, losing, uh, losing a wonder early on, like the pyramids, is an awesome one to lose. Um, you lose the benefit of the pyramids, and you actually start getting two culture return. Right, here we go. The war has been resolved. Now, this, the, there's different wars. This war is, is in specifically a war over technology. So the victor, which is me, takes science equal to the strength advantage from the defeated civilization. And I can also steal the special technologies as well. So I had 20, it had 11, which means I'm stealing nine science. So in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to steal code of laws and another three. Or if I wanted to, I could just steal nine science but he's only got six so yeah i'm stealing code of laws and three there you go i now have code of laws which basically means i get an extra action per turn so look at this this is nice this we like this okay and now that war has been resolved it is now my political action and if i wanted to and i think i'm going to i'm going to play another war it's another war over technology oh do we want to because yellow doesn't have anything now no, I, I don't think I'm going to. I'm, I'm tempted to, but if that was a different war, I probably would. But it's not. It's another war over technology, and I'm not actually going to get very much for that. So we could play Acceptance of Supremacy. This is a pact. I basically choose one of the other players and say, look, we're not going to attack each other for the rest of the game, um, but I'm going to get an extra rock, and you're going to lose a rock, basically. You accept that I have supremacy over you. I'm going to play Cold War because it's a it's a two event it gets me two points it's going to trigger another event which i think is going to be advantageous for me i think um and when it comes out i'm going to get six science hopefully if i'm still the strongest so that's going to go into the deck i get two points and we have that one that i put in earlier on which is all right it's fairly we all get a bit of culture right so the event is now evaluated and i lose the library of alexandria sad times but it's okay so I'm, let's, let's just look at the scores. I'm currently on 73 culture and I'm generating 8 per turn. Yellow is on 31 culture and generating 3. Green is on 40 and generating 2. I'm going to try and rush the end of the game now, if I can, because um, I'm in a good position. So, what were we doing? We were playing frugality. So remember, action cards, you play them, you do what it says, which was... Um, what, what did it say? <laughs> uh, it said increase your population and then gain three food. So I pay the four food to increase the population, then I gain three food. I'm going to play Engineering Genius to start building a piece of the wonder. Uh, ooh, do we want to play Urban Growth? Because that gives me a discount of three, and actually it only costs two. I might save that. I might save that. Because we have other nice cards here. We have tanks. We like tanks. Uh, don't get too greedy, Paul. Don't take too many cards. Um, multimedia. Oh, again, it's right at the end. I'm, I'm looking at multimedia because it's a library. This is the age three card for libraries, and I'm already down the library route. So that means I can upgrade. Upgrading is great because you don't have to then disband it and build it somewhere else. So I think I'm going to take this one. Even though it's going to cost me all of that money, yeah. Ooh. <laughs> well, I want to take efficient upgrade as well because I'm going to use that to upgrade one of my mines. I also need to make sure I have nine resources for this, which is next turn. So I'm, I'm actually going to do one stage this turn. And I need to remember that I need six resources next turn. Um, will the multimedia still be there if I leave it? because revolutionary idea is also good yeah there's a lot of good cards here there's a lot of very good cards um, yeah I'm going to risk I'm going to leave the multimedia there I think there's two in the deck anyway yeah there's two oh are they both on here oh it's there <laughs> there's one there I didn't see that there's one there and there's one there so in fact I'll take it I'll take revolutionary idea and I'll take multimedia 
there you go people in the chat are probably saying there's a cheaper multimedia yes there is thank you i just saw that um so i've spent all of my civil actions and we have corruption okay because i was i, I didn't spend any of my resources really I, i've saved them look at this so i'm suffering two points of corruption now at this stage in the game two points of corruption is not actually that bad but that's that means i'm going to lose two rocks which means I'm only then going to have five next turn, which means I'm not going to be able to finish the Transcontinental Railroad. This is where the undo button is your friend. I am not going to take multimedia. I am going to spend these to avoid the corruption. So how do we spend stuff? Well, I don't want to spend the rocks, so I need to increase my population and do it again. Yeah, do it again. So we have one orange face. We have a discontent worker. This one is discontent, but that's okay. I got rid of the corruption, which means I am going to have seven rocks next turn, which means I can use six of them to finish the Transcontinental Railroad, which is going to boost my strength even more. Yes. Military stuff. Do we want to do any military stuff? I don't think we do. No, we don't want to play that tactics card because that one's in play. We don't have enough resources to build another cannon. We're good. End turn. What are we going to get rid of? Let's get rid of... I'm going to get rid of the international... Oh, no, I'm going to get rid of this tactics card. Yeah, because I don't need that one. Okay. Yeah, we've gone down the uh, the cannon route with the fortifications. Oh, look at those. Lots of aggression cards. Now then. We've been quite lucky that all of the event cards so far have worked in our favour. This one, however, is not. This is terrorism. The civilization with the least culture points can destroy an urban building of each other civilization. So yellow has the least culture and can therefore destroy one building from both me and green. So what's it going to destroy? Uh, I don't know. Did it do it? What am I missing? Oh, it's, it's not done it yet. It's going to do it at some point. I thought it did it at the start of the turn. Hmm, what happened? Did I, did I miss the destroying? I think I did. Yeah, here we go. So yellow has destroyed an age two lab belonging to green and an age one library belonging to me. Now that's actually not too bad for me when the Cold War's just gone off. Um, so the one that's there has gone back here which is fine because I'm going to be playing multimedia soon. So it's, it's not actually too much of a problem. Remember, destroying the building does not kill the person. If you destroy a building, the person goes back here. That's the difference between destroying a building and losing their population. Right, greens go. What is green doing? Green has built or has started to build first space flight. So the wonders, oh no, sorry, fast food chains. Is that fast food chains? That looks like a rocket on a platform. Yeah, it definitely looks like a rocket on a platform to me, in the distance. It's not, though. So the Age 3 Wonders, how they work slightly differently. The rules are the same. You still have to take them. You have, still have to build them in stages. But whenever an Age 3 Wonder is complete, instead of it giving you, you know, a bonus, it actually just gives you scoring. And food, fast food chains is a way of getting a huge amount of points the more workers you've got. Um, the Age 3 events work differently as well, and I'm going to explain them in a minute. So, it's our go. What do we want to do? Do we want to declare war again on yellow? Declaring war on Napoleon is actually quite funny because Napoleon is normally a head-on strength. Uh, what is yellow going to be able to do on its turn to respond? It's going to be able to build another one of these. It's probably going to get 16 strength. So, I think I'm still going to... Oh, it's got patriotism as well. Okay, it might get more. Is it going to have more than me, though? No, because I'm going to be building the Transcontinental Railroad, and that's going to give me five strength. So I'm going to declare... And now, do we do war over technology again? No, I think we're going to do war over culture. So we are going to declare a war over culture on yellow. Now, this costs a political action and three military actions. There we go. So, declaring the war over culture on yellow. So that's two wars declared in this game. Wow. I, I probably declare war in about one in 
one in four, one in five games that I play, it's actually quite rare that I do it. And as I say, you can have entire games where there's no wars declared. I'm glad we've seen them in this game, so you are seeing the military aspect of it. Otherwise, I'd have had to do another video where we show that bit, but there'll be another video anyway, just showing different things. Okay, so, my go. Time to explain about tactics cards. You'll notice this tactics card has two numbers on it. If I have two uh, artillery and one infantry, I would get nine. That's what you think. You're thinking, well, hang on a minute, Paul. You've got two artillery and you've got plenty of warriors. Why don't you play that? Because you'll get nine instead of five. Well, I won't actually get nine because the tactics cards with two numbers on, you only get the bigger number if all of the military units that make up the army are from this age or the one before. Otherwise, they are antiquated and you get the lower number. So these warriors here, these are still age A warriors. They've still got spears, okay? So they are going to mean that this is an antiquated army and I'd only, I would only get the five. I still might want to play it because if I then upgrade them to riflemen later on, but right now playing that wouldn't actually change anything. So we are going to spend two actions. Well, no, it's one action because of masonry. We are going to complete the Transcontinental Railroad which increases my production and it gives me an extra five military strength. And the multimedia is still there, so it's all worked out beautifully. So we take the multimedia, we play the multimedia, which we can. Um, I am then going to play Urban Growth. And I've got all these options, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to use it to... Oh no, I can't. I haven't got enough rocks. Cancel that. Uh, can I do efficient upgrade? No. No, because the only rocks I have, I got one. I got one rock. So I didn't need to do that this turn. Because um, I'm not actually going to benefit from that. I could take civil service. That gets me even more actions. We could take modern infantry. Oh, let's take the modern infantry. Yes. So what I was saying about the tactics card earlier on, let's do it. Yeah, I'm going, I'm going heavy military in this. I am actually ignoring these leaders that could actually be really good. But if I take that, I lose the ability of, I lose James Cook's. I and mean, I'm going to lose James Cook's ability at the end of the game anyway. Albert Einstein is really good leader with a level three library, which I'm about to get. But I think I'm going to stick with James Cook. So what am I doing? I'm playing, I'm taking modern infantry. I'm playing, uh, do I have actions spare? Anything else I want to take? I might take this. Because I'm hoping to take one of these, a Hollywood or internet. Uh, yeah, I'm hoping to take one of these, I mean, not that one. But probably this one. I'm hoping to take internet before the end of the game. So this card will help me build that. So I'm actually planning, yeah, three or four turns ahead here take that. I think that's it. I think we're all good. I've got one military action left. I'm not getting corrupted. I could be... Have I got... No, I don't have enough resources. So, we're good. End turn. Discard a card. I'm going to discard... I'm going to discard this... Ooh. Acceptance of Supremacy. Because I'm never going to get a chance to play it. Because I'm going to be doing lots of aggressions and stuff. Oh, I've got to discard two cards. Don't make me choose... I'll tell you why. Let's undo this. I'm going to use my last military action to put this into play. Okay, because it doesn't actually change my military strength right now. And now I only have to discard one card, which is the acceptance of supremacy. Just means I don't draw any new cards. Okay, right. The game is starting to reach its uh, climax. It's escalating now. And everything is about age three, okay? Everything you've been doing in age one and age two is all just paving the way for age three. Age three is where it all happens, uh, the big events happen, the big wars happen and everything else. And this is one reason why some people don't like this game. There are some people out there who don't like this game. They're probably not watching this video because they'd have probably switched off two hours ago. But there are people out there who don't like this game. And there's a reason why. I'll come on to this in a minute. 
Iconoclasm is really bad for me. I'll come back to that. The reason why some people don't like this game is that if you're playing the physical board game, you would have been probably playing, if this was your first or second game, you'd have been playing for about four hours now, maybe four and a half, five hours. And then age three, and you think you're playing fine and you're doing the civilization building and you're, you're building stuff and you think you're doing well and you're building an empire. And then all of a sudden age three happens and it all goes horribly wrong, okay? And that feeling of, oh, well, I spent five hours playing this and I've been building this stuff up and now it's all just fallen apart. Once you know the game, the other players at that table would have been sat there looking at you going, yeah, good luck, knowing that, oh, you're going into age three with the two bronze mines or something like that. So yeah, age three is where it all happens. Anyway, we've just missed out on a whole load of stuff. So apologies for that. But the war has been resolved. I won 25 to 15, so I got five points plus one point for every strength difference. So I've just stolen 15 culture off the other player. But the thing that you miss, well, you didn't miss it, I missed it because I was nattering, was an event that came out. And the event that came out was, where is it, where is it? Uh, Iconoclasm. There you go, can we see it? Uh, how can we see previous events? Da, 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 da. I think Iconoclasm's in here. Yeah, Iconoclasm, there. So, yeah, this card came out and it says each civilization with a leader that is not from the current age must remove that leader from play. We are in age three uh, and James Cook was an age two leader. So there was me deciding to keep him. Well, he's gone, but so has Napoleon. Right, it is back to me. It is back to my political phase again. And here we go, we could do another war. I think we're going to do an aggression. Uh, I think it's going to work. Let's just check how many cards has yellow got. Oh, yellow has these cards. And a defense card from age three is actually worth six. So if he's got two defense cards, he could defend himself. What about green? I have a strength difference of seven over green. No, okay. If I did a plunder, I would steal seven rocks or food. Let's have a look at what they've got. Uh, so yellow has only got three food and four. Yeah, green is actually doing better. But yellow is the easier opponent. Yeah, yellow is the much easier opponent. I think we're going to have to hit yellow. I'm sorry, we're hitting you while you're down. Um, but I think we're going to have to do that. So we're, we're hitting yellow. We're going to do an aggression card, okay? So I'm doing what? This is my first aggression card. I'm playing an aggression card. We're going to see how it works. I'm going to choose yellow. And we're going to confirm it. Does yellow defend? No, yellow did not defend. So I'm basically stealing all of their stuff. Sad times for yellow. Right, it's my turn. I have now lots of resources. So we can play the modern infantry. We can now upgrade this to here. And look what's going to happen to the strength. 33. The reason it's jumped to 33 is this tactics, the entrenchments, now is giving its full value of 9. Because all of the units that are making up this army are from age 3 or age 2. So yeah, so we've got 33 strength. That's good. Uh, any other leaders? No other leaders. Air forces? Do we take air forces? I don't think we do. Uh, I'll explain them in another video. Um, I think I'm going to take an efficient upgrade. I'm going to use this efficient upgrade to turn my age one library into an age three library. There you go. Culture output has gone up. Science output has gone up. Um, do we take another efficient upgrade and just really go for it? Wow. Oh, there's the internet. Didn't we want that? We did. Is it still going to be there when it comes round to me? It might be. <laughs> It might be. Let's take that. Now, I've got all these cards. Uh, can I do an urban growth? I don't want this discontent worker. I'm not happy with this discontent worker. We could just build another bread and circuses. With it, I could build it without the action card. I lose one. Yeah, I'll build it without. Uh, I'm still corrupted. And that increased my population. There you go. So we've sorted out the corruption problem. We've sorted out the happy face problem. We've got a handful of action cards. This is quite rare. But next turn, I'm going to be playing a whole bunch of these. 
and we're going to be upgrading these two mines so I get some good coal mines. And I'm hoping that this internet is still there by the time it gets around to me. Okay, end turn. And we've got 34 strength, so you know what's going to be happening on my next turn. We're going to have another war. Or I might play one of the... Ah, Pact, right. So yellow is offering me a Pact. <laughs> Loss of sovereignty. Paul and yellow cannot attack each other. Paul produces an extra two culture, and yellow produces two culture less. And no one can declare war on yellow. Now, do I want to accept this, or do I want to keep attacking him? I think I'm going to accept this, because then that opens up my possibilities of playing other cards. So I will accept your pact. Thank you very much. In an in a actual real game, the yellow player would have probably resigned by now, because that is an option. Um, and I know it's bad form to give up on games, but in this game, you need to. If you are being absolutely hammered, you stand no chance of winning, and the other players are basically milking you for points, you just resign and get it over with. And it actually helps balance the game out. Because, uh, yeah, if, if other players are allowed to pick on you when you're weak and keep stealing stuff from you, that's, yeah, that's not good. Okay, right. Yeah, we're definitely getting into the closing stages now. This has been a good game. As I say, I'm not an expert player at this game. Um, so, while you might think, oh, Paul's making it look easy. Remember, I am playing against one tutorial AI and one medium AI. And the tutorial AI has definitely been playing badly. It should have been bidding for those colonies earlier on. Uh, that was an event that came out which got us some extra stuff. Okay, so I can't attack yellow. I'm now going to play my first Age 3 event. So, the Age 3 green events work, um, again, in a, in a similar but different way. You play them as events and they go into the pile as normal and because they are age three you will get three points for playing the card but all of the age three events are scoring so like a lot of games there is end game scoring but in in through the ages it's the players that actually decide what the end game scoring parameters are and they do that by seeding these cards into the deck if these cards come out during the game they will score at the time if these cards are still in the future event deck at the end of the game, you take them out and score them. So at the end of the game, there will be a whole range of end of game scoring. And I have two of these cards in here. I have Impact of Strength, and it actually tells you this is really nice. Right now, if this were to be evaluated, I would score 14 and Green would score 7. Okay, It's actually going to score when it comes out or at the end of the game. But right now, that's what that one would score. The Impact of Agriculture right now would score me 9, yellow 7, and green 11. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to prepare Impact of Strength. And here's a tip for you. This is possibly verging on advanced strategy. The blue player is playing an age 3 event into the deck. Everybody knows that, okay? You should know, and don't do this until you've played the game a few times, but you should have a list of what the 13 different age 3 events are. And you go, ah, Blue's just put an event in there. I wonder which one that is. And you can start to get an idea of what cards might be in there based on who's put them in the deck. Okay, Civil Unrest has just been revealed. This is the one that penalises you if you have Discontent Workers. Thankfully, I now don't have any Discontent Workers, but Green does. So Green gets a bit of a penalty. Right, it's now my action phase. What are we going to do? What is our plan? Because I think we've got this game wrapped up. Um, I'd like to show you... Oh, look at that. The internet's there. I'd like to show you building an age 3 wonder. So this is an age 3 wonder. It's going to cost me 2, then 3, then 4, then 3, then 2 to build. And it only gets me 9 points. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take it and I'm going to build it at the end of the game. I'm not going to build it now. I'm going to build it by the end of the game. Because it's going to get me points for uh, culture and science produced by my urban buildings. And remember... Multimedia is a library which produces culture and science. So unsurprisingly, the more libraries I have, the more the internet is going to score. So my job now is to have, how many, what's my urban building limit? Three, is to have three of these multimedias by the end of the game and then develop the internet and that's going to score me a boatload of points. And I think that is going to be my primary focus. So I'm, I'm not really going to look at these because I've got plenty of cards down here. We have 15 rocks. 
So the first thing we want to do is we're going to do urban growth and we're going to build a new H3 library. Boom, there's two of them. Then we're going to do an efficient upgrade to upgrade my mine. We're going to do another efficient upgrade to upgrade the other mine. Um, we've got four rocks left, which is not enough to do anything this turn. Do we want to build more military units? Uh, no. Do we, how much the engineering genius? That is five. So we want to save that for the middle stage. Yeah, okay. Right, well I said I wasn't going to do anything else, but I might do. Because there are other scoring cards that get points for special technologies. So I might take military theory. Um, and we've got four rocks, and I want to spend something so that I'm not corrupted. So I might as well just... I might as well just build one of them. Why hasn't that not avoided the corruption? Oh, because... It, uh, yeah. So this is the thing, although I have four rocks, that is represented by one counter on the three and one counter on the one. If I was to build this, it costs two rocks. The only way to do that is to move that down from there to there, which means I'm still corrupted. So I could build another one. There you go. Is that worth it? I've had to spend four rocks to avoid losing two. I don't think it is. No, I think I'll just soak up the corruption. Again, at this stage in the game, a little bit of corruption is not that much of a problem. So, yeah, I'm happy with that. And it will warn you, it will say, you're going to face corruption, are you sure? And you say, yep, I'm fine with that. Let's steal some paper clips. Right, we've probably got one or two turns left. Prosperity, each civilization gains a food for each of its happy faces. Nice. Oh, look at that, lots of age three cards in there. So well, I've only put one in there, but there are some other age three scoring cards that the other players have put in there. So I should be trying to work out what they are. I mean, I know roughly what I should be doing. And again, these AIs are not that great. Well, the yellow was, but it, it just got hurt early on. We have a historic territory. Now, the historic territories in the game, there's two of them. There's an age one that gets you six culture and one happy face, and the age two that gets you 11 culture and two happy faces. I've spoken to a number of experts at the game and they frown on these cards because um, they're not building up your engine. All they do is get you, a, you know, um, yeah, a, a bunch of points and some happy faces. I quite like them, but I know a lot of people say, oh, I'd never bid on these, they're just rubbish. However, at this stage in the game, I'm, I'm already quite ahead. Let, let's have a bit of a bid. Yeah, let, let's just bid two. Do I have any boosting cards? I don't. I'm not, I'm not going to get this. No, yellow has won the colony. That's fine. Have your 11 culture. I mean, it bid 11. Look at that. Yeah, green bid 10 and yellow bid 11. So there's me saying they're not that good. I guess 11 culture. So green has discarded that and all of these cards. Well, if it wanted them. You have left yourself vulnerable now, because I now know Green has used three of those defence colonisation cards, so now I could probably attack it. You need to be keeping an eye on what the other players have played so that you can seize the opportunity. Right. Is, gonna, is Green going to build an Air Force so I get to explain how Air Forces work? Possibly, possibly not. Right, I think we have two turns left. I have next turn... Yeah, the cards are going to run out this round. So this round, the, the cards are going to run out, and then I think next turn will be our last one. Need to be careful that I do manage to build... Uh, my mouse isn't working properly. Uh, this. So I'm going to need... What's that? Four, seven, ten. I'm going to need 14 resources to build it, which I have. So I could build it right now, and I would get 15 culture. Or I could be greedy and wait. The thing is with this game, you always get told if it, it is going to be your last turn of the game. The, t the, the end of the game will never sneak up on you. Um, it will always tell you before your last turn of the game, this is your last turn of the game. It didn't do that for this, so I know that I have at least one more turn after this. So yeah, let's... Well, look at all this stuff. Wow, this is crazy. Oh, it's my political action. What am I going to do? Do we declare another war? Yes. We're going to do another war over culture, and we can't attack yellow, because we're not allowed to, because we made that pact. So I'm attacking green. There you go. War has been declared. 
And yeah, I've got so many resources now. So we're gonna build another one of those. Um, how much resources have I got? I've got four resources, not, not enough to build that. Can I upgrade? No. Um, what else can I do here? Oh, we could change government. We could change to a democracy. The advantage of a democracy is everybody gets a vote. Um, no, it's got an urban building limit of four and it generates three culture around. Compare that to this, which isn't generating any culture whatsoever. So I think we could, or we could take Gandhi. If we take Gandhi, I can no longer play aggression or war cards, but Gandhi generates two culture a turn. Or we could take Charlie Chaplin that boosts my theatres. I don't have any theatres whatsoever. The next time I play, I'm going to probably go down the theatre route, just so you see different ways of playing it. Because um, we don't have a leader. Uh, what do I want to play? What do I want to play? I probably should, rather than doing that, I should have played one of these age three events. Yeah, I should have done that. That would have got me more points. Never mind. We'll do one of them next time. Um, so we're going to put military theory into play. Yeah, there we go. That's, that's a silly amount of stuff now. So if we do the revolutionary idea... That gives me nine. I'll have an extra ten next time. I can take democracy. Uh, I mean, we could take the move. No. Yeah, let's take the number. Yeah, let's take the democracy. And I might just take Gandhi and just not play it this turn. And then put Gandhi in next turn. Or do we put him in this turn? If we put him in this turn, I am going to generate two culture. Yeah. Yeah, we'll put him in. There you go. We've declared war, and now we've got Gandhi. <laughs> um, okay, we've got four military actions. We've got four resources left. Again, do I want to spend those resources? I don't think I do. No, I think I want to save them. I'm going to suffer two points of corruption, um, but that's fine. Yeah, that is absolutely fine. We're going to have 16 resources next turn, which is enough to build uh, the internet with the engineering genius. We're all good. Yes, I'm fine with the corruption. So let's see those cards go. Okay. Uh, oh, yellow and green now have a peace treaty. Oh, bless them. Not going to help you. Okay, yellow has developed oil. It's still building temples. It's desperate. It is very desperate. Okay, only took one card from the row, but those two go... There we go. We are now in age four. So all civilizations lose um, two yellow things. I discard three age two military cards, because we're now in age four, so your age two cards go. Yellow loses the unfinished Eiffel Tower. We hit him so much he wasn't able to finish it. Yellow also discards some extra cards. And the International Trade Agreement Pact between green and blue has expired. Such a shame. Oh, and we have a territory that's come out. Now, do I want this... I might as well just bid. Oh no, I could bid, I could bid this. Yeah, because I've no use for this card other than for bidding for territories. So I'm going to bid, and we're just going to bid four. And we didn't win. Yellow won the bid. Okay, so yellow has actually sacrificed these units. Wow. But yellow yellow can't be attacked by me or by green, so it's fine. It's fine. What's green doing? Destroying farms. Is it going to be able to build the fast food restaurants? I don't think it is. Again, green is like a training AI. It, it's making a lot of bad decisions. It's, it's literally making mistakes. So the war outcome, I steal 26 points of culture from green. Yeah. Final turn of the game. Here we go. What am I going to do? I can't do uh, armed intervention. An aggression card in your hand. You cannot play it now because there is no valid target weaker than you. Well, that's not right. There is. So that that's 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 a misleading message. I can't play it because I'm Gandhi and I'm not allowed to play it. So that's the reason that's the real reason I can't play it. Yeah, you cannot play aggression cards or war cards. So if anybody from CGE is watching, slight tooltip bug here. That needs to be uh, that needs to be changed. Unless I've missed something. Um, now let's have a look at these age three events. That's gonna score me sixteen points. That's gonna score me twelve points. 
and that's going to score me eight points. So I'm just going to put the impact of variety into play. Come on, mouse. There we go. So we're going to play that. I get three points for playing it, and we get an age three event. So the impact of happiness has happened during the game. That is one of the age three events. Uh, green didn't get ha any. Green is not happy at all. Oh no, it was based on impact of happiness. Yeah, I thought it was two points per happy face. Oh, but then you get negatives. Yeah, and green's got green's got three unhappy faces. Okay, so my last turn of the game, and we, we're going to build this. We're going to build this, and we're going to put democracy into play. We've got 19 science, so we can put that into play. Uh, we will develop it peacefully, so it only costs one action. Da, da, da. Uh, then we're going to spend one action to build two stages of the wonder. Remember, we've still got masonry that we took early on. Then we use engineering genius to build the third stage, and then we complete it with the last two stages, and we get 21 culture for it. There you go. Right, I've got four actions left. What can I do with them? <laughs> Is there anything I can do? Well, yes, I could build some temples because every temple generates one culture. So we could actually... Oh, we could build one of those. One of those generates a culture. Um, and now we can't build a temple. That's fine. Let's have some more people. There we go. Um, and let's build let's build another warrior. There you go. I'm just I'm just spending my actions now. There's actually nothing really that I can do that's that's of any use. If I was taking my time, I would have really looked at the other age three events that are in the game and possibly built according to them, because some of them give points for food, some of them give give points for resources, etc. etc. I'm just gonna end the turn. You still have a civil action left. Yes, never ever end your turn with a civil action left during the game. On the last turn, it's fine. Because there's nothing for me to do. And the one take back I've got from this is that I should have played with green on the medium AI setting. I, I wasn't sure how difficult it was going to be. Um, and I, I didn't think I was going to do that well. But we did, it, we did okay. <laughs> bit of an understatement. I probably made it look a bit too easy. Impact of science, which is 14 points for whoever produces the most science, which is me. Uh, seven for green, none for yellow. So that's another of the age three scoring cards. There's one that rewards you for science, one that rewards you for uh, food, one that rewards you for resources, one that rewards you for just having special technologies, all sorts of different things. And now we are going into the end of the game scoring. So here we go. First card, we have five events that we are evaluating. The first one is impact of balance which it's doing now. Basically, you look at how much of each different type you're producing and you get the mean. The next one is impact of strength, which is the one I put in. So 14 for me. Uh, impact of variety, uh, different types of unit, urban building and blue technologies. Yep, I did well on that one. Uh, impact of government. Oh, nice. That's really nice for me because I ended up switching to democracy at the end. So you get points for civil actions and military actions. Again, against other players, they probably wouldn't have put that card in if I was going to score far more points than them. And finally, impact of progress. Yeah, two points per level of each of your government and special blue technologies. So again, I made a killing on that one as well. And there we go. That is a full game. 303 points. But as I say, the AIs, I had set them on, a, on an easier level. It's been a while. I hope you have found this video useful. Thank you very much to everybody for bearing with us um, who've been here since the start. Um, or thank you to everybody who has watched this video. Even if you've not watched this live, if you're watching this afterwards, thank you very much for bearing with me. Three and a quarter hours it took. But as I say, I played a full three player game of this the other day. Was it three player or two player? I think it was three in 20 minutes or 25 minutes while Vicky went shopping. So on the app, playing against the AI, once you know the game, you can play it really quickly. And playing asynchronously, I'm in a number of asynchronous games at the moment, it's fantastic because you do your turn, you know, when you're on a break or something like that, you do your turn, you have a think about it, you do your turn, you send it off, and the next day you get a message saying it's your turn. So playing it asynchronously is a really good way um, to play the game. 
Anyway, I'm going to wrap things up now. This is the first in hopefully a series of videos. There is so much more to talk about in this game. There's so much more in there. The next time I play, uh, I'm, I'm talking about possibly doing uh, a game with other people from CGE. So we will do a live game where I broadcast my screen, but I'm actually playing against other human opponents and we're talking to each other. That's one of the things that I'm planning to do. There's also challenges included in the game, okay? And these are the original challenges. I have the expansion pack, but we're not using the expansion today. These are all these challenges. These are the ones that I've done. These are the ones that I haven't done. The challenges are fantastic because they give you uh, variant tweaks to the game and make you play the game in a different way. So I fancy picking one of those challenges and doing that so that you see how you have to adapt your strategy. Um, so yeah, I'm planning on other videos in future if you want to see any more. But yeah, if you've liked this video, uh, please leave a comment. Please obviously like the video, click the little thumbs button, subscribe to me if you're not already subscribed to me. Put a comment in there to uh, help with the algorithms and everything else. I'm going to go for a lie down now. Um, this, is, <laughs> this has been quite tough, but it's been really good. Through the ages, uh, I know CGE is one of my clients and I'm friends with a lot of them there. But CG is one of my favourite games of all time. I've been playing it, as I say, since 2006. It's a masterpiece of a game. It's just a brilliant game. And it's so involved and it's so detailed. Um, and I just love it. So anyway, thank you very much for watching. Take care, everybody. I will see you later in the week for some more videos. And maybe some more Through the Ages next week. Um, but yeah, until next time, if I can find my software. Where's my software gone? There you go. Until next time, take care and thanks for watching. Proudly sponsored by Game Toppers, upgrading your gaming experience. Visit GameToppersLLC.com.